Welcome to Safe on Deck. For episode 18, I sat down with Captain Dan Milicevic aboard Naval Air Station, Pensacola. Millie graduated from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in December of 1995 and earned his commission into the Navy via Officer Candidate School. After winning his Wings of Gold in December of 1997, Millie was selected to serve as a radar intercept officer, flying aboard the legendary F-14 Tomcat Fleet Defense Interceptor. As a newly qualified replacement Rio, Millie flew combat missions over Kosovo in support of Operation Allied Force and over Iraq in support of Operation Southern Watch. Next, Millie went on to serve as an instructor NFO at VT-86 Saberhawks and as an overseas NATO staff officer before transitioning into the Navy Reserve, where he continued his career of instruction. He was recalled to active duty to deploy with a Joint Special Operations Command Unit in support of Operation During Freedom and was then selected to command the VT-86 Squadron Augment Unit. More recently, Millie instructs the next generation of weapon systems officers and electronic warfare officers as a contract sim instructor utilizing the Navy's next generation virtual mission training system. Additionally, as a captain serving in the Navy Reserves, he continues to train fleet aviators as a senior Naval Aviation Warfighting Development Center Adversary Tactics Instructor Red Air Controller and as the Nautic Reserve Unit Perspective Commanding Officer. Thanks for taking the time to listen. In the future, I plan to continue to share similar interviews with both current and retired military aviators. If you have a question or suggestion for a future interview, please leave it as a comment below. Safe on Deck, Episode 18 with Captain Dan Malichevich. Enjoy. I start all these the same way. Millie, I'll start the same with you. Where were you born? I was born in Elizabeth, New Jersey. New Jersey. Yeah. Tell me about New Jersey. Yeah, exit 13. Um, not sure. I escaped when I was 18. No, not to knock it. My family uh, settled there. They... Mom and dad uh, both came from uh, overseas, actually, from former Yugoslavia. Dad, when he was a kid, on foot, the old-fashioned way. And mom came over, and she was early, a uh, little bit after. They met over in Pennsylvania, where some relatives were, and they decided to settle in New Jersey, where a church was being built, and that's where I was popped out. <laughs> okay, very cool. What was the connection to aviation? Was that something as a young kid you remember? It's funny you mention that. Um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do as a kid. I remember going to a McGuire Air Force Base for an air show. Uh, which is a big wing area and they had an f-14 doing an aerial display and i never i still remember looking up and seeing the big dorito making a giant turn going what is that that's awesome and then i uh, went along the line and saw a couple of the jets and said okay this looks like yeah that looks it that's and, it and what age do you remember gosh 13 okay so big impression like yeah, big impression, impression. Age. And yeah. i said okay that's that sounds about right and i was already doing boy scouts so i was i was digging the whole you know uniform thing and getting groups together to do stuff together and like I put two and two together and that's where that's where I ended up yeah. any any family connection to the military uh, not really uh, yeah I mean my my mom's side she had uh, out in Pennsylvania all the steel workers in the mills like you know when there's like seven uncles and seven aunts and uh, all my great uncles I think seven of eight of them were all in World War two um, one of them my uncle Nick had a great great reputation he ended up serving for God, I don't know maybe 30 something years and you know, basically World War two Korea and on and yeah, I retired as an E9. So most of my relatives served in the Army. My dad got drafted in Vietnam um, even before he got his green card, which was pretty funny because he could have played dumb at the line and said, no, speak of no English, uh, and walked away. And he said, nah, this is, this is my home. Uh, this is what I'm going to do. So uh, I'm all in. And so he, he, he did it and joined the Army, and, uh, which was kind of weird because I got lucky. He ended up doing a bunch of stuff, and he broke his leg. And there's like, look, you can't go over now. And then the, his guys went over. And he actually lost a couple of friends when they went over. Anyway, so I was like, that's the best accident you ever had. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, what, so, what, what a like a history of service though in your family. That's incredible. A little bit, yeah. So I'm the first Navy guy and the first officer, which makes it pretty interesting. I remember joking with my uncle Nick. Uh, hey, you gonna call me sir? And I goes, Nah, <laughs> I'm retired. <laughs> you said you said the next question I was gonna ask. First Navy guy. Why the Navy? Was it the F-14? Um, I well, I went to part of it, yeah, and okay. I went to uh, school number Riddle Aeronautical University. This was before they had ROTC. And I learned uh, an interesting stat that something like 88% at the time, 88% of all astronauts come out of the Navy. I was like, hmm, that's a, I wonder why. Um, and so I thought, okay, sounds interesting. And it wasn't Top Gun, even though everybody says Top Gun. I think part of it was, uh, oh my gosh, the movie when they go uh, back to World War II and the carrier, and I'm going blank right now. Final Countdown. Final Countdown, yeah. thank you. And I remember yeah. those scenes like, okay, that looks really cool. Uh, but it was really seeing... Because I knew the Air Force, we had an Air Force ROTC and an Army ROTC over at uh, Embry-Riddle. 
at the time. This was back in the mid-'90s. Um, and they had a Navy Flying Club. And at the time, the Navy Flying Club, which I was part of because it was, you know, introducing people and uh, going to recruiters and doing paperwork and tests, I think we put more guys in pilot and NFO seats than the top three ROTCs combined. Because it's Ember Riddle, you know, guys want to fly. Um, and so I just interesting statistics about, you know, like I said, the astronaut corps, and look, a lot of them came from there. I thought, oh, that'd be really wonderful. What a dream to be able to do that someday or at least have the opportunity to try. And I, uh, I, I didn't, I mean, nothing knocked out the Air Force. I just didn't appeal, I don't know, the lifestyle, the choice, the whatever. And I think the F-14 just sold it to me. Like, I would love to be in an F-14. We talked about Embry-Riddle. Was that your first flight in an airplane when you were at Embry-Riddle? Um, Civilian-wise, yeah, actually, yeah. It's kind of funny. I knew I wanted to go there to the point where I sent one, one application. And I was like, this is where I'm going. And uh, my parents thought I was crazy. And I was like, no, this is where I'm going to go. And went away for Christmas break and came back, and there was the letter. I'm like, all right, awesome. I know I'm going there. So I already knew I was locked in there. Um, what did you major in? Aerospace engineering. Okay. Yeah. And then um, when I got there, remember Zimber Riddle, uh, for people who don't know, has a pretty large flying department uh, as well. So you can go there and get your four-year degree in you know, professional aeronautics and you know get your CFI, CFWI, flight instructor, instrument instructor, uh, quals. And I actually had a roommate my freshman year who was going through that. So they're flying Cessna 172s, and they're like, hey, you want to go for a ride? Sure, you know, I'd love to. So jumped in with him for the first time. That was my first private pilot, jump in the seat, kind of playing little little small job thing. What did you think of it? It's small. <laughs> <laughs> Underwhelming, I'm yeah, guessing. It was yeah. uh, it was fun. I'm like, how many hours do you have? 16? Yeah, this is this safe. This is a good idea. No, he was, he was already certified. Um, but that was the first time I actually flew in a small airplane. And then after that... Um, didn't really bag too many hops because I was busy in school with my nose in the dang library while he was off, you know, doing happy hour stuff all the time. Uh, and then he went on to do other things and uh, just kind of pursued the kind of the Navy career from that. So I didn't really get to jump in airplanes and fly until I got to flight school, really. Gotcha. Um, other than, you know, commercial air like everybody usually does, that kind of thing. And I didn't even, I think I jumped out of an airplane during flight school just for fun as a go, go skydiving one time just to try it out. For professional development, I was going to say you're braver than I am. I like to stay inside the airplane. Yeah, ideally we'd want to do that. I thought it'd be cool <laughs> to try it once just so to see see what it's like. Totally fair. Yeah, yeah it was fun. Yeah, you were the airplane in that case. Yeah, yeah basically. So where'd you go after Embry Riddle? What was the next step? I uh, I had a very compressed timeline. It was very bizarre, and I don't know. Every year to year, when people go to flight school, it's different. Like for me, I graduated in the December of 1995, and I was at OCS here in Navy Pensacola. Uh, I checked in January 7th, 1996. Oh, my gosh. Um, and then we went through OCS, graduated from OCS. I, I messed up my shoulder, had to wait two weeks, and then kept going. That was, that was fun. And then uh, finished OCS, and I think within two weeks, I think it was 10 days later, I was in API. How was it AOCS? Was it, uh, this was was it what you expected? It just became OCS. It was just yeah, OCS. Yeah, so I okay. think it was like one or two years after that. So we had the class of uh, everybody. Yeah, but it was still great because I mean it was right here. So when when Gunnery Sergeant will let United States Marine Corps, you know, got us face down in the volleyball pit mashing us, and the Blue Angels are flying overhead, you get you get motivated to keep uh, okay. One more push, you know, keep pushing. Um, so that was pretty nice. Um, yeah, finished that up. Literally ten days after that, API, if API finished. I think the day after, checked into over here VT ten for primary training for NFOs because I'm blind as a bat, I can't see anything. Um, so literally by the time, so and I finished that one right to, and it just the progression was so fast that I found myself, you know, meeting up with the fleet squadron and I still had a way. I came back from my first cruise and then I promoted the lieutenant. No way. <laughs> yeah. That's insane. Yeah, so we went to Kosovo and Iraq and came back and then finally, oh, by the way, you're a lieutenant now. Well, great. Thanks. <laughs> and we have folks that are probably going to be pinning on 03 at the FRS or yeah. maybe before they get to their fleet squadrons. Yeah. It's not uncommon now to have uh, the guys and gals here in flight school and they're all, they're, you know, JGs and one or, yeah. Even here before they get the wings. Yeah, it's kind of a crazy thing. And I was already coming back from that first cruise, blowing stuff up. It was just a different time. Just It yeah. was compressed. It was I've heard of folks that winged as ensigns. I mean, yeah, winged, absolutely. Yeah. And the Sear grads and stuff like that that would yeah. stick around. And it was just a different time for, just like I said, I don't know what pipelines are. They, they vary. But it was pretty interesting to be able to come back and. I bet experience. it was. Yeah. You mentioned VT10, though. What uh, would you fly VT10? The T34 mm. Turbo Tormentor. Turbo the, the Mentor. Tor I've yeah. not heard it called the Tormentor. That's yeah. awesome. <clears throat> it was fun. It was interesting. It was uh, the first time I sat in the front of an airplane to actually fly one. And I still, as an instructor here now, as a contract simulator guy, I try to relate all as many stories as I can of, hey, I was sitting at that runway at the whole short, just like you're about to. And these are the mistakes I made. Um, looking five feet in front of the propeller, hoping I can remember which way is up. You know, houses get bigger. 
um, it was a lot of fun. It was uh, it was more complicated than it needed to be. At the risk of being one of those guys that the walk up hill both ways guys, the T six Texan nowadays is a, is really is a pilot's airplane. Um, and I think uh, without going too much on tangent, it was it was simplified in a way. I think the Air Force really pushed a design where they wanted since most of their guys end up going to fly essentially, you know, uh, jet jet airplanes that have a single, you know, throttle and stuff like that. They wanted to have one power control lever, no beta, no weird freaking mixture prop throttle stuff, that kind of thing. So the T-34, nope, that had mixture prop throttle. It had a little bit of beta. You can kind of make it back up even though you're not supposed to. The NATUP said you weren't supposed to with the operating manual. Um, uh, it had a you know, no ejection seat, so you put your chute on the old-fashioned way, and you, you I still remember the bull face, crew camping, cord, harness, dive, D-ring, because I didn't want to die. Uh, which was getting out of the airplane the old-fashioned way. Um, one sad story, actually. My first, my gosh, it was you know the early phase of familiarization flights, sitting in the front, and we're out doing touch and go somewhere. And we got a—I tell this story all the time to the young bucks here too. Get a radio call on base saying, "Hey, 99 RTB." And I think at the time that somebody said contaminated fuel, which I've never heard before, never heard again. And the first thing the instructor in the back said was, "Uh oh, I think we just lost an airplane." So we come on back, and sure enough, there was an airplane with an instructor and student, and they were doing touch and goes and had an approach turn stall, uh, and they didn't get out in time, and they both died. And I remember thinking, this is my first couple of weeks of flight school. What the hell's an approach turn stall? <laughs> right? I, I read about it. What is that? And then it's, it was an eye opener of, you know, this, this business is it's not unsafe. It's safe. It's just, as that classic line, it's terribly unforgiving of carelessness and neglect and mistakes yeah they and punish you so that was the first week a couple of weeks of flight school in FAMS, and i remember thinking okay this is a serious business you know you better get smarter than than you are and hit the books hard and so with that airplane that was part of what i was getting at was very uh old-fashioned in that the the, the the emergency procedures were very not convoluted but there were a lot of steps it wasn't oversimplified um it, it was it was i think designed on purpose to to be kind of a, a filter of can you absorb and sponge a lot of material and a lot of bull face and emergency procedures and things like that and limits and stuff that were, let's just say, not as <laughs> nowadays with the fade deck controllers and things I'm sure you've talked about before with automatic stuff. One button push, the engine starts. No, that thing was, okay, okay, get the gerbil on the treadmill. All right, that kind of thing. And I think that was by design to complicate things to, to kind of test you know, mental acuity as well as character, quite honestly. Absolutely. If yeah. you can't do it at that very basic primary level, you're not, it's not going to get easier. The yeah. systems don't get simpler. No, what's that great line? And I, I mean, I'm a backseater, but I get it. it. was like, if at first you don't succeed, you know, carry landings aren't for you, <laughs> basically, because uh, it's just going to get worse. And so it was an interesting airplane. It was a lot of fun to fly in Pensacola. I learned a lot. I learned I didn't know anything about flying, which was hilarious. Uh, you can probably relate as a pilot instructor here. I remember taking off from runway seven right from my first takeoff got airborne gear came up and i didn't know which way to turn I was like just locked up <laughs> like i know i'm going straight he's like are you gonna turn right oh okay <laughs> that was day one yeah that was fun so, and the syllabus has changed too because in your day you 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 just mentioned it your hands around the flight controls right yeah. you were actually flying yeah they called it the super foe program the idea was uh to get and there really is. I think there is a, a lot to gain from um, the difference between, even in the backseat perspective, like flying a flighter. When you have your hands on the stick and throttle, I think you're more in tune to what the airplane's doing and what it's going to do and what it needs to do versus looking over your right shoulder for where's the bad guy and, and the blue water, blue sky, no horizon, which way is up. I count the beach. I think that's three turns. So so having that concentrated, they called it the Super Foe program, which I think it was like eight FAMs. And where we touched a little bit of everything from basic start taxi takeoff, flying local area. I think I still remember like the FAM 7 was aerobatics and stuff like that. So we did a little bit of everything. So by the time we finished that really abbreviated pilot syllabus, okay, now you get in the back, you understand what we're talking about with, with all the real procedures sure. and local area operations and stuff. And it was great. And we've got obviously different rules now in terms of, you know, when the students can have their hands on the controls you know, below certain altitudes. And yep. I'm not going to get any specific, but the point is, uh, yeah, I wasn't around then, but I kind of missed that mentality. I want the students to, I guess the example I'd say even on pre-flight, um, some folks will just be, hey, jump in the back of the bird, I'll, I'll get the pre-flight done. And I'm like, no, you're going to, I'm going to have you open and close panels. I'm going to have you look at everything. Tell me what this is. Tell me what that is. Because I want you to. I want you to have that same yeah. vested interest. And frankly, when we're away from home station, like, yes, can I pre-flight this airplane? Absolutely. I'm yeah. not worried about my skills. I want that second set of eyes. I want that crew mentality 
develops now at the, the very basic level because yeah. I don't know what's going to happen at the advanced level. Yep. I've, I've seen some jet guys kind of just walk around the airplane and yeah, I think everything's still connected and jump in and I say that sarcastically, right? But uh, in the helicopter, we'd, we'd pre-flight for an hour sometimes. Right. It was a pretty intense thing and everyone's a part of that. Every you know, crewman, yeah. the pilots, co-pilot, whatever. Um, I want that mentality. I hope they, that's something when they fly with me, I hope they leave with because I think that's really valuable. And we've seen how tr- training changes. I think that's a really cool you know, value that you bring here is you've seen what it was like and what it is now. And As a dinosaur, yeah. I didn't say that. Not even close, that's sir. Okay. Uh, that's okay. That's right. <laughs> but no, like truly th- th- that continuity and training and that knowledge, um, you know, I'm only in this job two or three years and then I'm gone, right? And it's that constant churn of people. It's nice to have people that have seen it all. Mm-hmm. I did want to ask about that though. So you yeah. mentioned the super fo- the beginning of it. Then where do you go after you've done that? those first couple flights in the airplane is uh, it right and into instruments and they go in the back seat yeah and then we finish up essentially some generic stuff to go right into instruments yeah okay. and then from there i kind of it kind of blurs at that point because it was just fast and furious um to finish primary um oh now absolutely low levels uh yep a little bit of strike yep. stuff low levels things like that and Forms, i just remember I, I just remember suffering in instruments the most because it was you know me and a wh- for people who don't know those little computer the whiz wheel is not your friend but we still use them. We still use them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I'm one of the old guys that says, I think that's a good thing. I think it is too. Cause if you can't divide by six, you're going to have problems. Yeah. I'm going to be unpopular with some of my students. If they ever hear this, I don't think we should let them fly with iPads. And I know that's the, the maybe the wrong thing to say, but I love nope. paper pubs. I 100% I'll take it one step further and it, it, it goes off on a tangent for a moment. It's okay. No, let's as, do it. As yeah. two instructors, I have a very strong, uh, aversion to people who don't know the basics, stick and rudder skills. And we've seen that in the airlines already. As a, speaking as a reserve guy with a lot of buddies that are flying for reserves, um, where they're so used to automated systems that they forget the stick and throttle stuff to the point of they don't understand things that could get them in trouble. Um, and they're all competent professionals. I'm not saying that. But one quick story I remember reading, it was uh, one of the European Airbus airline flights. And long story short, the co-pilot was a brand new co-pilot. came out of typhoons. And there was something going on with weird things. And the airplane started stalling because it was basically exceeding its angle of attack. And the captain was trying to fight the automated system, and the co-pilot just went, what the hell with this? Grab the stick and put it to four. He just unload. He just unloaded the airplane, saved the airplane. And he got all these, you know, hey, great job, nice job. You saved the airplane, and maybe potentially a mishap. And he's just like, I just, all I did was unload AOA. <laughs> That's what we do. What's the big deal? And it was just stick flying, kind of basic stuff for stick and rudder. So um, – What's great about the current stuff, like, for example, Super Hornet and the F-35, they have magic carpet for the software for coming in for landings. And speaking as a backseater, you know, in the old days, I think it was something like from the, from the time a, a guy called the ball to the touchdown was something like 200 inputs between the stick and throttle. I mean, very finicky close control stuff. I think the average with, again, don't quote me on this number, but I think the average is about a dozen inputs with magic carpet. Okay, great. That's great. What if something goes wrong? Can you fly the airplane? Can you fly the airplane? And that's a question that's an open question. So having an iPad and not being able to look out the window and go, all right, if the beach is that way, Canada must be behind me. Key West is that way. So La Vegas must be over there. So home is off to the left 10 o'clock. If you can do that, then you don't need a GPS. Yeah. But if you need a GPS just to tell you where the bathroom is. We're in trouble. We're in trouble. Yeah. And the other side of it is we may fight in a GPS denied environment, right? Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna, that's the first thing that's going to go. As it should, right? I mean, you want to yeah. take away people's ability to navigate. Absolutely. It's, you know, flip that switch. The other side of it is, and this is the, again, any students that hear this, I apologize because you've heard this story before, but you know, in Bahrain, 120 degrees, right? No air conditioning in the helicopter. And I'm dripping like an animal, just sweat coming off me. Couldn't use the iPad, right? And what do we do? Our greasy nav bag literally was greasy because it's a 53. So there's high fluid and oil and all yeah. that back there pull that forward pull out the paper pubs and let's go like, yeah but I, I was forced to do that in the t6 up front as a student from the beginning from the beginning and i can fall back to that level i don't have yeah. to oh god what is this paper pub and, and it might even sound silly the ability to flip and the ability to fold them in a way that makes sense meaningfully yeah. in flight if we don't do that at the beginning how do yep. you ever get it back you're, you're the navigator you have the right to know where you are and where you're going <laughs> it's simple as yeah. that all right i'll stop it i'll stop tilting at windmills over here but no. uh yeah I, anyway oh automated systems don't get me wrong what it's we're wonderful. doing nowadays yeah. is night and day i wish i was a jo and be able to do this stuff again seeing what i'm seeing now with the especially with all the great link stuff we're using and it's phenomenal i mean we just recently did in, uh doing some radar stuff i'm sure we'll talk about we had the air wing guys bring in some guest players, and they brought F four F twenty twos to join in for the air, for the air picture, and it was amazing what those guys were able to do, integrate, incorporate, and do together. I, as a red air guy, I actually felt bad. <laughs> like they really kicked our butts. This was great. <laughs> so your job is to lose, and that's your point. You want to win until they beat you up, and now they're ready to go deploy. And so it's the only job I've ever had in the Navy where I hate winning. Because it's kind of like, all right, we got to get the blue air guys and get a little better. But when they integrated everything in the F-35 integration, when they do it right, 
they're whooping our tails, which is the point. And then you can kind of go, all right, have fun deploying. I'm going home. <laughs> yep. Yep. Do you remember ballpark how many hours you had in the T6? Or good Lord, the T34 when you were going through primary? I, for some, I think I remember when I got to the RAG. Oh, my gosh. It was for the FRS. It wasn't that much. I think it was like a grand total of 140, 150 hours. Okay. So maybe 40-ish. 40 40-ish. I think okay, it was about cool. the same as today. Maybe yeah, even a little less. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because we had a different program. VT10 had primary in the T34. And then classic stuff went jumped into the uh, the T1 Jayhawk where we had joint Air Force training here. So what was really interesting about what we had, and I kind of miss it, and I'm glad we have them still here, was it was all joint. So the instructor cadre was Marine Corps, Air Force, Navy. So we had F-15 Strike Eagle guys and B-52 Navs. We had Marine F-18 Delta guys and Prowler guys. So the instructor cadre was huge. So we had joint integrated training to the point where we were borrowing T1s from, from Laughlin Air Force Base. And we actually had a contingent of jets just for nav training, just like they do right now. So we had the joint training for that, primary instrument stuff and jet stuff, high-level stuff, uh, as well as low-level strikes and stuff like that, just faster speeds. Uh, and then when we finished that intermediate phase, then we kind of selected pipeline. And when I went advanced jet, it was to the T-39 Sabre line. Well, years and years ago, there was supposed to be a replacement for the Sabre liner that never happened. There was some contract stuff. And so it, it went away, and the multi-crew NFO training plane went away. The Air Force was so delighted with the training. They loved it so much. They said, we're staying. And they built a school, and they stood up the freaking wing right here to bring their T1s in because it, I think it works really well. Now, I'm not knocking. The T45 works great. That's what we're flying down here now. It'd be nice if we had either T1s or I don't, some other kind of a, yeah, like you talked about, multi-crew NFO training platform. And only for one reason, because any pilot can teach any NFO. And I think any NFO, if it's competent, that has some experience, can, can teach a junior pilot. And that's kind of what the relationship is sometimes in the backseat of, a, of an airplane when you have a new guy check in. You're his mother-in-law, basically. Um, is having that pilot, co-pilot, where the students in the co-pilot seat, the contract pilot in this case, doing their thing, and you have essentially a guy like me sitting in the jump seat looking over your shoulder going, all right, what are you thinking? What do you think the pilot's going to do? What do you think we need to tell him? What do you think he needs to know? What do you need to do to make this mission happen? That kind of thing. And be essentially that that angel or devil sitting on the shoulder kind of thing. And then at least also you can easy to reach him over the head with the approach plate. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So having that interaction real time in an airplane was also yes. pretty, pretty vital. And you could focus on the instruction while the contract pilot was doing the flying stuff. Um, I did not know that there was supposed to be a replacement for the T-39. There was, and there was actually money at one point allotted and mm. something happened. I don't know. And, and so by then I think the, the way they wrote the contract, it was the, the replacement airplane had to be like aerobatic capable or some other things. And like, they just couldn't find one. And so it, it just died on the yeah. vine. And the Air Force said, we're staying, we're building a house, and we're bringing our planes here. And they stood up their, their CISO training, combat system officer training. Interesting. Well, yeah. it makes sense. You know, you can kind of levy the goods and the bads from all the services if everyone's working together. Absolutely. Best practices. This is the way, integration is the way to go. So if you can sit in a ready room and across the table from you, is, hey, there's a Marine Delta F-18D guy, and there's a Strike Eagle Wizzo sitting there. And, I mean, again, you can literally bounce around all the best practices and all the lessons learned. Because that's all aviation is, is learning other people's mistakes. Absolutely. Yeah. You're not going to live long enough to make them yourself, yeah. so you want to learn from someone phenomenal. else. And you would see them again, like when they stood it up, the first CO was an old J.O. buddy of mine. We were instructors together, so, so it was a good excuse to get invited to their bar, basically. <laughs> I wish there was a little bit more back and forth and kind of lessons learned between us and them, because it Absolutely. is kind of two insular worlds here on the same base. Yeah. I don't think by design, I don't think there's any you know negativity there. It's just... There, we're not maybe forced to play in the same uh, yeah. sandbox. It'd be kind of neat if we were forced to. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I would like to see more integration, too, because they're all great great guys and gals over there. Back to you. Um, obviously, I know where you went, but you know, at some point, there's going to be a bit. You talked about you're done with intermediate, right? Mm -hmm. you got to figure out where you're going next as a student. Where did you want to go? I wanted F-14s. You knew you were wanting to go? Oh, yeah. I, it was funny. Uh, when we went through at the time, and it's, it comes and goes, obviously, flight school to flight school, decade to decade. But when I was coming through... You know, they farmed out. There were more pipelines. Um, so for when I was an NFO, they had just gotten rid of the A6 right before I started flight school. So the bombardier navigator, Floyd the intruder, box man guy, he went away. I just watched so, that movie recently, by the way. And why is it always the NFO that dies? It's ridiculous. <laughs> Goose, box man. Although in behind enemy lines, we'll talk movies That's later. That's a good point. Yeah. Finally got hey, the pilot. Finally got <laughs> finally let the stick nerd go. <laughs> um, so. Uh, we had choices of different platforms you go to, and it was, you know, for, uh, you could be E2 NFO, or you can go uh, S3 Viking, uh, so you can do the S3B, so you can be kind of anti-ASW surface and sub-warfare. Um, you go F-14s and go go Strike Fighter. In that case, it was mostly fighter. They didn't really call it Strike Fighter yet. Um, 
And so, and Prowler, EA Six P Prowler. And so, I really wanted Tomcats bad, just because since I was a kid. And uh, coming through flight schools, maybe there were in the previous months there'd be like one drop or two drop. And so there was a one or two, and then there was a month with nothing, and then there was one. And, and I'd gone through, and there were none for a couple months. And I had a whole class full of really good guys and gals, really sharp, all of them. I don't know how I got through. Uh, and they all wanted them. And then our class came through, and it was me and my two other roommates at the time because we shared a house on the north side of town. And they had the drop, I'll never forget this, at the O Club on base here, Officers Club. And they had the, uh, okay, everybody, here we go. And three of us, all three of us roommates, all got Tomcats at the same time. I was like, what? Oh, I, had to walk, I had to walk out, went to the pay phone at the time, called my mom and dad, said, guess what? And then went back to the bar and just got lit. <laughs> I bet. It because, was, yeah, what, I mean. Because nobody thought anybody was going to get no. one. It was months. And then if there was, it'd be one, then nothing. And we were sweating it. Uh, and then it turned out to work out pretty well. That's so cool. What was your time at 86 like? What were you guys flying there? Was it the T2? It the was time? fine. Yeah, it was interesting. T2 it was, and, sorry, T39. Yeah, T39 yep. and the T2 because uh, they had the A4 and they had some problems. They were just going away. And so, and then the T2 got what's called red striped. So there were some accidents going on where they realized there was some issue with some kind of uh, in the tail, some kind of big screw thing that was the trim and counter trim. We think it was pilot error, but there were enough mishaps that occurred with it that the red slip is they basically grounded the fleet until they figure out what the hell was going on, pardon my language. And so I was in a class of, there was eight of us that were trying to finish our advanced training and they didn't know what to do with us. So they started sending guys, uh, the class or two before us, they sent like some of them to Meridian and go class up, they still had A4s up there. So they literally, hey, would you mind taking some of our NFOs and just throw them in the backseat of these things and do some abbreviated syllabus stuff with them? So they went up and flew A4s in Meridian, Mississippi. And now our class came around. Hey, we don't have any more room. What, what are we going to do with that? Uh, hey, Air Force guys, can you call your bros and see if there's something we can throw out in them? And what they had was at Columbus Air Force Base, they, have the, uh, they had the AT-38 Talents, the, the Smurf jets, the blue camel ones, where they do what's called IFF, Introduction to Fighter Fundamentals. So their pilots go through their training, and they get qualified up, get their wings, and then they go to IFF, and they learn how to fly in section and do, do tactics, do dogfights and stuff like that. They do it as almost like a separate intermediate FRS between graduating and actually learning in a gray airplane. And they said, well, can you throw some of our NFOs in there and kind of help, you know, maybe fly with your instructors and just observe, I don't know, have a syllabus. And I think they took some old Vietnam F4 syllabus and, you know, dusted it off and said, all right, you knucklehead. So seven of us or eight of us show up in Meridian, Mississippi, check in at Columbus Air Force, I mean, uh, Columbus Air Force Base, excuse me, by Meridian. Um, okay, what are we going to do with you guys? I don't know. Let's go figure it out. And we had just basically bag tops in the T-30, T-38. But that was a ton of fun. It was amazing because it's a very fast airplane. Um, and the, everybody we flew with were instructor pilots. So it was great. It's just like a, any other two-seat airplane squadron or syllabus, and which is universal. I think it would be forever. Um, you know, the lead aircraft of the, in those guys, they call them four ships. We call them divisions. Uh, is always that a senior pilot. That's usually a division lead qual guy. And so typically you put a junior backseater in that lead airplane. And then dash two is that junior pilot working his qual up. And so in his backseat could be either an instructor or in this case, it'd be an instructor. So I would be in a, a flight of two or a flight of four. And it would be a very salty instructor, me in the front, in the back. Dash two junior pilot Air Force guy working on something. In his backseat would be another instructor. And then if there was, you know, repeat so I was getting the best of, you know, all the great training that I could and hitting a lot of golf balls, even though I didn't hit them well. Um, so going through their entire syllabus, dogfights, uh, a little bit of air to combat, a lot of strikes, a lot of cats where they carried those uh, Mark 76s, you know, the BDU blue death little bombs. I have a couple, yes. Um, absolutely. They make great door stops, right? <laughs> Indeed, 25 pounds. They're great. Every time, um, yeah. So basically, and got to learn, okay, this is how these guys do cast and closer wow. support and, yeah, you know, yeah. and stuff. And we drop and I didn't get to drop, but... And when I wasn't doing that, I'd just go in a simulator and go fly around because I thought it was fun. So um, It's funny you mentioned that, some of the, the good things about it. I'm curious, obviously. You're a Navy guy through and through, right? What are things maybe we could learn from the way that they instruct their folks? I know it wasn't exactly a one-for-one -one, um, analysis, but... Uh, there, a lot. I think we can... It, there's things the Air Force does way better than the Navy. And there are some things the Navy does way better than the Air Force. And everybody can sit and talk about all the goods and others. And it's not to deride them. It's just bit practices or policies. I think they're more... When you check into an Air Force training squadron, and it might have changed, but when you check in on this day, you know the day you're going to graduate. You know the day you're going to go to this thing. You know the day you're going to move kind of thing. And in the Navy, it's a little bit more fluctuant and fluid. And it's needs of the fleet and, you know, weather and parts, whatever. There's a lot of flux and stuff like that. So 
Um, and, and it's nobody's fault in particular. It's just, you know, human beings are going through a pipeline, and if they need second and third looks at certain flights, you know, we give them to them if they deserve it, that kind of thing. So um, I, I was very impressed with how regimented and structured it was, where you knew exactly what you needed to do and where you needed to go and how long it would take, that sort of thing. Whereas sometimes when the Navy training we do, by nobody's fault, it's like, okay, we're going to class you guys up. We're going to wait a little bit because the Sims are kind of slammed. So we're going to send you to Sierra School early, and then you're going to come back. And, hey, the well, hurricane season's coming, so we're going to get a debt. Oh, the debt got canceled. Debt, you know, training somewhere else, that kind of thing. And so there's a little bit more, which is good because it teaches you to kind of flex a little bit. And there's nothing like a little, you know, if you're not flexible as an aviator, you're not going to do last very long either. So you learn kind of Semper Gumby pretty quickly. Um, so I think I think I, I just liked how they were struck. We knew exactly where we had to go and what we had to do and what time we had to be there and we were going to get out of there. <laughs> the funniest part was all the pilots would show up for this and they would have their wings already. Well, they didn't know what to do with us because we're the only we're the eight Navy guys. So they say, here, where are your wings up there? So we didn't graduate yet, and we are wearing our wings walking around Columbus Air Force Base, you know, flying all that stuff. And then we went home to get winged, which was even kind of like, all right, talk about getting a big head. That's but, awesome. Yeah, with 0.0, .0 hours, you know. <laughs> was it still at the museum here when they would wing you all on base? Yeah, I have a very, very special uh, love affair with that museum. It's a very close place in my heart. Actually, Sturz, uh, Searles Gilliam, who's run it now, um, my first JO Fleet tour in CAG-8, he was the CEO of the of the VAQ-141, the, 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 Growl, the Prowler Squadron, excuse me. Uh, great guy. So he's the perfect guy to run it. Um, so I got my commission there. Uh, I got my wings there. Um, I, I got married there, had a reception. It's one of the only two Navy muse or museums in the country that you can actually kind of re rent it out after hours and set up in the atrium underneath the Blue Angels and actually had, we had our wedding reception there. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, that is so cool. They live, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I did my, uh, my reserve change of command, uh, outgoing there as well. So, uh, uh, yeah, I love that place. It's a wonderful place. Yeah. I think we're so fortunate that we have it in naval aviation. I know I got to speak with, uh, obviously, the director, uh, Admiral Kozad, a couple uh, couple weeks ago. And I know they're working their very best to try to open it back up to the yeah. public. I think that's one thing that they're, everyone wants. Yeah, a lot of great people over there. Yeah. 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 Admiral yeah, Kozad's a yeah. great guy. Yeah. Preserving the history. That's what and sharing it with other oh, folks. Oh, I can see us. You know, maybe you and I someday will be over there wearing our blue blazers walking around telling sea stories i can think of worse things to do absolutely sure. after we retire though yeah yeah really? a couple of years i'll give it a couple of years we'll get yeah. a couple <laughs> maybe um, me less than you <laughs> uh let's see so okay i'm trying to i, I jump around a little oh, bit in time yeah, and so space finish here. up yeah. the t30 t30 t38 bravo which is funny yeah. so i have a smurf jet patch in one of my collection of boxes very like, nice well, are you in the air force no why do you have a yeah it was weird uh it was great it was unique. Oh, another last thing was great was the different backgrounds of those guys that I got to fly with. The CEO of the training squadron was an F-117 pilot. So it was really interesting kind of getting perspectives even at the bar talking after hours about just mindset mentality of how they did their mission and job and things like that. And I think I spent more time asking them why an F-117, which was an attack plane, had an F in it. Because even then, even though I had 0.0s 0 .0 in the top cat, I still thought, well, that's, that's what? Yeah, it didn't make sense. Okay, anyway. But, uh, but neat seeing perspectives of single-seat, two-seat guys and different, different backgrounds of so many different airplanes. Because uh, coming out of there, there was a, quite a few different ones. And then flying again with the Air Force and the Navy guys back here and stuff. It was, it was great. Some of the best flying experiences I've ever had were in the T-39, actually. Because what was great about that, and I'll shout out to those Gray Eagles, um, those guys in that left front seat had been there, done that more. <laughs> I think one of the jokes was uh, one of the guys was having a discussion with a student. I'll never forget as I was in a jump seat as an instructor. And the student was not arguing but kind of trying to say, no, we need to turn right. I'm like, no, we need to turn left. And we need to turn right. And at one point he goes, son, I've got more time and tension on a catapult than you've got in the Navy. <laughs> probably, We're going left. Probably accurate, yes, and you and, should turn left. And we went left, yeah. <laughs> It was great. Like, you really want to argue with them? I don't think you want to do that. This is a this is a crew resource uh, management moment. Let's have a teachable moment here. Listen to the guy. He knows what he's doing. And you mentioned the term gray eagles, and I want to make sure I, get, I kind of unpack that as well. It yeah. was folks that were retired naval or marine aviators, right? Yeah. Even um, a couple Air Force, too, yeah. Really? Yeah, okay. absolutely. So I didn't, I didn't yeah. know that, but they're civilians at this point working for, I don't know what the contractor was, but a it, civilian contractor. Yeah. And L3, they're, a couple of different ones, yeah. Okay. L3, yeah, I think yeah. it was yeah, definitely L3. I remember hearing that. Flying a Navy jet, flying a T-39, yep. but then like you talked about, you know, student NFO in the front, front front right seat. You've got another instructor NFO in the jet, and then potentially another student there as well. Absolutely, yeah. F sixteen radar on the nose. Yep, Is that you're correct. Sound right? Yeah. Okay. So the two models in it. Yeah, we might talk about. It, but uh, so we had a couple stretch model Gs, which were essentially VIP ones that you could fit eight people, nine seats. Excuse me, but eight, and then one was left over for luggage. So that was great for 
That was a cross country machine. It Golf was, clubs you were talking about. Oh, earlier. skis. I had a buddy go to Texas and go buy a drum set and bring it back. I mean, it was, Hey, you know, if you're going to get the train and get the hours, well, it may as well. Um, so we did a lot of called it Saberhawk airlines. We had a lot of cross countries, which is great for students because there's something to be said for, for, you know, Hey, we start talking about, you know, field elevations and all right, well, let's go to Colorado and land somewhere where, you know, it's 4,000 feet MSL, zero AGL. You're going to learn all about reading your radar altimeter. <laughs> um, so excellent, excellent training. And it was a good opportunity to go visit really cool places. Uh, otherwise, the majority of the fleet were were essentially uh, six places. So pilot, co-pilot, jump seat, and the co-pilot had a stick controller that had the F-16 radar on the nose. And in the back, there was actually also two more stations as well as another jump seat. So you had three stations total. Any one could be running everything. Early and early, what we call strike phases of radar strikes, where you could kind of like a B-52 bomber guy kind of thing. You could sit in the back, and one or two of the early ones where you were in the back and you ran a strike mission from A to B to C to D, just sitting in the back. And so you could swap out students in front and back and get multiple missions on one, on one, you know, essentially sortie. Um, so you can load up an airplane with like two or three students, go do an out and in or whatever, and knock out a, I mean, knock out four or five X's, which is you know training mission. And you guys weren't like up in the bozo sphere. It's a business jet, but I remember seeing these things scraping the hills of Georgia, oh, coming in low yeah. and fast. Yeah, there was there was it was you can go upside down, you can pull some G's. We were doing full, yeah, we were doing intercepts, we were doing strikes at 500 feet AGL. Yeah, we were. It was it it, it was a sturdy. It's a sturdy. It's just still flying it. It's still around. Yeah, it's what a, a way to airplane. learn. Yeah. yeah. So it was neat. So it was, yeah, and flying with those guys was, again, was one of the highlights of my career between being a student and also coming back as an instructor because they were some of the best pilots I've ever seen in the world, honestly. They're really good. I believe it. Well, you talked about highlights. Let's get to the the next highlight, which is definitely the Tomcat. Yeah. It was, you said Oceana? Is that where you went? Yep, Oceana, yeah. Okay. Is which that where was, everyone wanted to be, I'm guessing? Was it Oceana and Miramar? Those were your uh, two options? Well, Miramar had gone away, so the only rag that was left, yeah. So 124 closed down So because of the East Coast, West Coast. There's probably a lot of reasons. I'm sure there's books about it, but my understanding was oh, uh, there are. <laughs> a little too far away. And maybe a different mindset kind of thing. So uh, it was just VF uh, 101, the Grim Reapers, which was the only rack for us. And so, uh, yeah, left here um, with my wings coming out of the museum, which was great. And then headed straight up there and found an apartment and just jumped right into the rag and met up, which was uh, which was another wonderful experience. Um, what was day one like? Do you remember? I mean, you're in a yes, you've been in a flying squadron at this point, but you've not been in a fighter squadron. Nope. Do you, was it a distinct like, hey, I I didn't know if I was allowed to wear a Tomcat patch on my shoulder because there's always these weird flight school things, and anybody can say that like, oh, can you wear it when you wear your cover and you wear your you know your cover? Should you put that little duck bill in the back or not? And can you always, wear the brown leather jacket uh, before oh, you land? The brown yeah. shoes, <laughs> and then for us it was, hey, congratulations, you got patched up. You're going to be going to the Tomcat rag, and hey, you're going S threes, you're going prowls. And so of course I bought a Tomcat patch, but I didn't put it on because I wasn't sure if one of the other Tomcat instructors would go, yeah, how many hours you got? Oh, zero point zero. So I didn't wear it. And then we check into the rag, and then the instructor's like, where the hell is your patch? Oh, sh- come on, man. So you can't win no matter what when you're a student. Um, so it was that part was intimidating of, like, this is the real deal, guys. And you look at the flight line, like, okay, that's, yeah, you better get smart in this airplane because there's no more training after this. You're going to go do it. Um, so it was, it was, yeah, you get your, get your nose in the books and get smart, and, but still have fun. And then, you know, try to have fun, and your classmates usually help with that. And that's where it gets really interesting because people start talking about East Coast, West Coast, Japan, and where they want to go. And we had three different models we can get. Uh, there was an A model, B model, and a D model. And the pilots were really sweating it, rightfully so, because you have to learn, and even I. And so we had, if you're going to be an A slash B guy, you have to learn both sets of engines. So, you know, the TF-30 P414 for the A models and the GE motors for the B. So essentially you get like a dual NATOP squall um, in, 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 in the FRS to give them more opportunity or more options to figure out needs of the Navy when you graduate, who's going to go to what squadrons and where you're going to meet them. So they just knew early on if it was going to be D only because it's separate, you know, they're separate airplane, digital stuff, completely different uh, interior, I mean, guts and things like that. Um, and then the AB guys had the same Aug-9 radar, but the engines were different. So you had AB class guys and D guys. And all the AB guys, I know every, well, I'll freely say it as a fact, and anybody can say otherwise, everybody would prefer Bs because those things were phenomenal engines. You had a slick F-14 with Bs on there. Wow. You put an A on there, nothing wrong with the A. There were older airframes, and that's fine. I think in my first fleet squadron on the top hatters, we had uh, the third F-14 off the production line as one of our jets. And it was one of the best flying jets in the squadron. It was really well maintained. We had great, fantastic maintenance. 
Um, and it was older than me, basically. Um, but A's had a propensity, like uh, rightfully earned, as sure people talk about a lot. You know, I, let's just say I got really good at really good at compressor stall emergency procedures, and I still remember air start you know, envelopes of 310 on the left and 295 on the right to get everything started for windmills and stuff. Because, it's different for each side. Yeah, because the left side had extra accessories and gearboxes and stuff on uh, there for like the wide yeah. eye for the hydro, whatever. So there's a for couple sure. extra things. Yeah, yeah. So it had more gears to turn. So 310 on the left. And why do I remember it like it's the back of my hand? I don't know where my keys are right now. I'm not sure what I did uh, for what I put in the garage, my, you know, whatever, but I had 310 on the left, 295 on the right, because you're going to need, and I used it <laughs> a couple times. Uh, and even once over a rack when we lost, we had a compressor stall over a rack, but that's another story. We'll, so, we'll circle back to that one because I want to sure. hear about that it one. Was, yeah. It was exciting. This is a good CRM thing when the pilot doesn't tell you what's going on. And you're like, hey, uh, literally like out of Top Gun, something I need to know about up there? <laughs> it's one of those kind of moments. Yeah, it's pretty funny. And so these are, and we're talking about the A and the B model of the Tomcat. The A model, that was a Pratt engine, correct? Yeah. Yep. Uh, my family will kill it's me it. when I say this. I say it every time. Uh, the old joke, I've because my family worked for Pratt Whitney in Middletown, Connecticut. Awesome. Uh, the old joke, what is it? It says Pratt on the engine. It better say Martin Baker on the seat. <laughs> I don't know if that's if that's something that I've heard it said once or twice, and it's kind of mean, <laughs> but I'm also told GE makes a damn good engine. Uh, yeah. I, don't get me wrong. I had, had a, you know, the thing worked. I mean, yeah. you know, we went to combat and used it and did what we needed to do. So, uh, But there's something to be said for, I think I remember, God, I'm going blank now, but I think I remember like when the guys would go to the boat in the B model. Yeah, the B model squadrons, they would do catapult shots. I remember the engine, you know, idle all the way to military rated thrust, and then you go all the way past that to afterburner. If they went to afterburner on the catapult, it would actually bend the stuff in the nose and the and the yeah and the launch bar. So they took mill shots. They didn't go burner. Would they go burner down the stroke? Oh, I'm sure everybody would. Like okay, them. Sure okay, would. But, but you could not sit there in afterburner it, it would, on. They were mill uh, shots. Yeah. Yeah, because there's too much thrust. Yeah. So there's no such thing as too much thrust. <laughs> there's no such thing. It doesn't exist. You can't have too much. There's no such thing as too much gas. The most useless things to an aviator are runway behind you, airspace above you, and fuel you've dumped. If you don't have enough thrust, no. As that old great line from the old Tomcat with the F-111 was, there's not enough thrust in Christendom to get this thing to be a fighter. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so uh, And EPs, it was much more reliable as much. I'm sure you might have talked to Easy from a previous one. Um, the pilot's left hand was a little bit more liberated and during dogfights to in a B motor in a, in the G motors, you can really, I mean, you can abuse that thing and go out, you can push that idle thing around. Your idle power. And yeah. just really yank it around right. and, and you're, you're less likely to get yourself in trouble than in an A where if you weren't careful, it would let you know, oh, I don't like this. And oh, what was that? Deedle deedle. Yep. Compressor stall. Okay. Knock it off. Okay. Did we ever attempt? No. Yes. Oh, air start. Oh, great. Here we go. Right. Um, so they were a little more finicky. Um, but they still kicked a lot of thrust. I mean, was it like uh, 17,000, 77 pounds? So, I mean, it's not as much as a GE. It might be in half of what we have now. Um, so, so But it's a big airplane, too. You need that thrust. So I, I noticed a difference as a, just an NFO, an old future Rio radar intercept officer, you know, flying in an A, and the next day flying a B, and the next day flying an A. I'm like, uh, we're doing, what are we doing, a dogfight tomorrow? Can I get a B, please? <laughs> Can we please be in a B? I want that thrust. So um, at 101, what's the syllabus like? I'm guessing ground school, sims, and then you're going to eventually get your first flight in the airplanes at ballpark. Yep. And then the different phases, they named them different things now. But from what I remember, it was kind of like you had FAMs, familiarizations, just basically welcome to the airplane, um, which is interesting for pilots versus Rios. Talk about real quick. And then we would get into uh, things like, uh, God, I remember the phases. Uh, we don't call it OWIE, all weather intercept. They call OWIE now. And back then it was like we called it tactics. There was strike. There was class for cast for close air support. Um, so that was part of the syllabus. I was going to ask about that later. Yeah, and okay. tactics was the last one putting it all together. And we went to Key West to do a tactics step. And that's where I finished up the RAG, RAG FRS, same thing. Um, and so, so the very beginning, yeah, WCS, that's right, weapons control. So it was a WCS phase was basic intercept. So I still remember my first familiarization flight was great. Oh, side note for pilots, because then they probably tell you more about it. But in, in, at the FRS, basically the pilot goes for their first. There is no two seat Tomcat with two sticks. So after the sims are done, you know there is a pilot instructor that sits in the back with them for a couple, and then they go fly with the senior with the Rios uh, and that kind of thing. Whereas I just jumped in. That was a unique. What was a great thing? A few great things. A lot of great things. Uh, a unique perspective about being a, a junior backseater is you learn very quickly from the best because you're always flying with very salty senior guys, usually in the lead part of an airplane. Uh, leading things like that so you have to absorb and sponge but you're absorbing and sponging all the greatest practices right away and then you kind of progress on as you kind of get more experience and you can start flying with the junior guys and, and you can see so uh, as a side note i remember the first couple of times hitting a tanker with some really good pilots 
they made it look so damn easy. I was like, oh, okay, great. Okay, I, I almost took it for granted. And then I still remember the first time I went with one of my J.O. Buds, and we went to hit the tanker, and let's just say the tanker was hitting back. And I remember thinking, dude, what are you doing? Like, get it in there. He's like, man, this is hard. <laughs> oh, I guess it is, because I was so used to seeing it done. Per- same thing with Ball behind the boat. First time I went to the boat, I flew with a guy named Woody. And he made it look so easy that we were actually laughing about it. I was like, wow, that thing, man, that ball is just centered up right down the middle. And the first time I saw a ball disappear, I went, oh, that's not good. <laughs> so I didn't realize, I realized obviously how hard it is, but sponging that kind of best practice stuff from senior guys really made, by default, by Darwinism, you had to learn, uh, but it made a quicker process. Absolutely. Uh, that you could take to the junior pilots. Um, you so, mentioned that first flight, though, in the airplane. Do you remember it pretty distinctly? Yeah, it was with, uh, he was actually Skipper Vetch. He was a former CEO of uh, the Diamondbacks, and he was a CEO of the RAG, made 06. And my first flight was a fan flight with him. And uh, nice guy. Uh, what I remember most about it was I had a blind date. Sorry, honey, but that was a long time ago. Uh, to go to an Elton John concert. So my first flight at Tomcat that night ended with a blind date at an Elton John concert in Virginia Beach. Well, how weird is that? That's rock and roll right there, right? There was actually a good concert. I don't even remember her name. Doesn't matter. Um, so uh, the first flight was one of the one of the highlights that I remember again, especially because this was a B. So we jumped into B first. Was uh, it's usually a performance demo of Hey, welcome to the jet. Start taxi, take off, go to the local airspace, and that kind of thing. And let's see what this thing can do, so you understand, you know, what you're getting yourself into. And one of the things I'll never forget was he said, "All right, let's do a quick." Uh, and I still do it with students here uh, with the airplane with the jet stuff, which is. All right, we're going to be straight and level, and we're going to start at 250 knots, and I'm going to basically, you know, hit the afterburners, hack a clock, and let me know when we hit 350, that kind of thing. And we'll remember the numbers. And I'll do it at military rate of thrust, and we'll do it again, unloading an afterburner so you can see how much energy you can get back. And it was, I remember when he kicked in the afterburners, and I was being pushed back into that chair hard. It wasn't like, it was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And then I did remember doing it again, another flight later, in, in the F-14A, which had five zones of afterburner. And you can feel each zone kick in. One, two, three, uh, and there it goes. So I just remember that feeling of, yeah, that's quick. This is pretty fast. Okay, okay, we're going to be pulling some Gs in this thing. You better start doing squats, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and that was one of the highlights. And then coming back for the break, and it was a gorgeous night, and land, and then I go to an Elton John outdoor concert. Like, man, this is the life, right? I got to go back and do it again tomorrow, right? <laughs> no concert the next day. So was it a was high fun. bar? Was it a high, a very high standard that was expected of y'all as students? Yeah. Um, at the risk of being that old man walk uphill both ways thing, there was a st- three strike rule. So starting from API, uh, aviation pre flight indoctrination, where you check in up until you got your wings, if you had three unsats, including academic failures, you were out. So at any time you got something, you, you were sweating it. If you got a second one, that's it. If you got a third one, it was usually. Yeah, good luck, and where else you're going to go, but you're not going to do this unless there was extenuating circumstances. So, uh, so it was very <laughs> it's different than today, and that's not knocking today. Today is a little bit more refined. The system is really laid out really well for recognition of you know areas that need improvement, and we can focus on them. And if you need retraining on something, good. We don't want to waste a good you know person. Uh, waste that's not the right word, but we don't want to we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater um, because over time we'll figure out if people are aeronautically adaptable or not, but. Uh, you know, we can't have a zero defect Navy. It's impossible. It's an impossible standard we hold ourselves to sometimes. I think people freak out when they realize, like, you know, somebody has one minor thing and it's like, that's it, your career's over. Well, wait a minute. You know, Admiral Spruance, when he was a young leader way back when, I think he led a squadron of destroyers or uh, like four or five of member ships, but he let them, they grounded. He grounded them. If that happened today, good, good luck making French fries, but they're like, all right, lesson learned, you know, and he actually grounded a squadron of destroyers in shallow water leading them so how you know calm seas don't make good sailors you have to learn and i'll tell you what people that do screw up screw up that's not the right word learn a hell of a lot more about stuff and get better at it by the by the hard way as long as nobody gets hurt and you know nothing's broken okay now we can do better and you're going to probably be the expert on that from now on okay good that's how you learn so uh so the three strike rule was very intimidating uh, cause I freely admit, I don't think if any students are listening, my, my guys and gals, yeah, I got one in VT 10. I was an idiot, right? I didn't know what I was doing. I learned the hard way and I became an expert <laughs> pretty quickly, uh, the next day. Um, cause I didn't want to get rocked out. And so the rack was the same way in that it was a little bit more of a, Hey, you know, this is a, uh, for all the greats about it and how look, it was a challenging, complex airplane. It's not, uh, it was not the most user-friendly one in the world where it was, uh, you need to really 
uh, learn more than just what the book said. And there was a lot of witch doctor spider craft, and there was a lot of listen to the uh, you know the guys that work on the jets. And these are the secrets and tips and tricks to kind of coax it to life and get things. I remember once uh, flying with the Aug9 radar um, and screen kept. I, I basically kicked it to get it working again. I mean, I've got weird stories. It was like, well, get it working. And uh, it didn't matter. And if you even had trons coming out of the front of the nose, as one CO once said, like, if you got trons coming out of the nose, you can still fight. Well, I lost my pulse stop. That's okay. You still got pulse fight. <laughs> okay. Make it work. So get it going and get the mission done. And that was kind of the mindset as well as old fashioned kind of, Hey, you still got to know where you are and what you're doing. You have limited, you know, there's no GPS and four flight and that thing. So you have to kind of really kind of get your head out, uh, uh, you know, out, out amongst you of where you are in the fight and who you are and where the other guys are um, to the point where you can actually do entire air to air intercepts. If you, if your radar went out, there was no excuse. You could still listen on the radio and make tactical calls. And there were guys that were really good at just by listening, just by listening, knowing exactly what the air picture was and what was going on and could still maintain lead until we got to merges and then they would press the lead, the guys that had the radar, basically. Wow. It was phenomenal, yeah. I learned a lot from those guys. It was, it was an art form, yeah. The big thing I think you're learning that was fighting as a member of a team. It's not just you. Yep. And that one jet, it's not just the two of you. You're working with others. But let's talk about the two of you. What was it like learning to fly with a pilot? But, you know, Unique. there's there's things that you, uh, you, you bring that he can't have up Absolutely. front. Absolutely, yeah. And vice versa, right? You can't start the F-14 without somebody in the backseat. It won't, you just can't. Really? Yeah, you need somebody there. So if there was ever a VIP flight, they would go in the back seat. All right, who's got the, all right, go in there, go start it up, and then get them, you get out. <laughs> like, no, I want to stay in this thing. All right, I'll go, I'll start it up and get it ready. Go ahead and strap in, congressman, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, have fun taking my flight hour, right? That kind of thing. No, it was okay. So, yeah, so it was very, and it's to this day, we still train to this, but it was a very missionized cockpit. Very specific things that were front seat only, very specific things that were back seat only. Uh, that you could interact with. Occasionally, some things overlapped. For example, you know, the pilot up front could shoot you know, Phoenix missiles, but there was a launch button in the back to shoot. So I actually shot a Phoenix missile from the back seat. Yeah, it was great. Not for training. Um, uh, so, so it became a dedicated. How do we, you know, and the weapon school guys and all like they they figured out the, the the crew resource management of who does what when to kind of make it all work out. And so, in the F fourteen, in the A B, in the A where I was, you know, deployed with. Yeah, I ran the radar, uh, and I ran all the beyond visual range stuff, and I ran the lander pod for the you know for the targeting pod stuff and the target acquisition stuff and the laser guiding and things like that. The pilot didn't do that. The pilot had all the within visual range stuff and the sidewinder stuff and all the dogfight stuff, and that's the pilot stuff, as we say. And I just hung out on the back and just kept sight of everybody I could, right? Um, and so it was it was more missionized that way. So you had to work as a crew together. You had to uh, kind of get to the point where you almost mind melted and finished each other's sentences to the point where you shouldn't even be talking on the ICS. Because if it's something like that during a tactical thing where there's timelines and everybody's on the same sheet of music, if it's that important, you're probably saying it on the radio to the rest of the flight as you're telling your pilot as well, like if you're shooting or maneuvering and things like that. So, yes, there's some ICS going on, but it's to the point of you're on the same wavelength my analogy I use sometimes is um, uh, there's a movie, uh, Ocean's 11, Ocean's 10, 13, whatever they are, 15, 27, whatever. <clears throat> and one part where two main characters, I think George Clooney and Brad Pitt, are sitting on a park bench after Julia Roberts shows up. And they're, and they're having like a conversation, but they're not saying, a, like, they're, did you? Yeah. Are you going to? Yeah. She's going to? I don't know. Like, what the hell are they talking about? But they know exactly what they're talking about. They're on the same wavelength. And that's kind of what happens when you sync up with a pilot where literally as they're kind of saying, hey, give me, and you're already flipping the switch. Hey, go and throw me like vertical scan log VSL. I'm already flipping it as he's asking for it, that kind of thing. Hey, give me that boom. And hey, go ahead and start to yep, tally. You know? And so you're, you're finishing each other's sentences. And when that happens, when two minds meld like that into one mind, that's when a two-seat airplane proves its worth. And that's when it quite honestly beats the crap out of the one-seat guys because they're just overwhelmed with stuff. They're great at what they do. Don't get me wrong. I'm really impressed with what a modern fighter pilot can do. But when you get a two seeker, especially in close air support, doing FAC A forward air control roles and things like that, and you're juggling and managing 15, 20 airplanes in the stack and calling guys in for strikes, and it's putting two airplanes, two guys in the one that they can mesh like that, you, 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 you can beat anybody. You can take you, I'd be in an F 14, and I'll be like, let's go to the merge with those guys. I don't care. I think we kick their ass. I think we can do it. That's awesome. Um, and that's probably probably stupid thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're and you're surrounded by circuit breakers, and that's something that reminds me very yeah. much of my old helicopter, the fifty three. It's yeah. a very how many did you have? I don't even know. Uh, we had two huge panels in the back, and the air crew would use the back of their hands and just run them down. I think it was like three hundred or something for that's you in good. the back there. Rookie numbers. We yeah. had eight panels. 
Good ridiculous. Okay. And they, they were, were big. I don't know if they were. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, yeah. it's amazing. And what is yeah. it? Super has what? Four. I mean, it's ridiculous. Is it really yeah. that small? Two and two. It's stupid. Wow. Uh, so yeah, design has changed the way that a we lot. build airplanes has changed the technology. The, yeah, the F-14, the A model, the AUG-9 had a tape load. And it took seven minutes for the alignment to kick in, whatever. I mean, it was probably a gerbil on a treadmill. Um, let's just say when handheld GPS has started becoming popular back in the you know late 90s. or Yeah, that's when we started <laughs> actually putting them in the airplane, just hanging on to them. It was like a little device that would just be, yep. yeah. And basically put a little adapter thing on the in the back seat. You have the handle that goes across. I call it the oak crap handle, right? It has a little chaff flare dispenser. You can look over your shoulder. And in, in, in Top Gun, the movie, you can see him grabbing onto a handle all the time. Anyway, so I would just mount a GPS onto that and run a little antenna on the suction cup on the side just because. I have a great picture of a, this Garmin, you know, I don't know, the 100 series led screen with lcd whatever and it's a picture of like baghdad and our little own aircraft position over it like ah, that's cool i don't know what i did with it um now it's all on your cell phone that's it yeah, forget it now so yeah digital cameras um <laughs> but yeah so so the mind meld with the, with the with the pilot was pretty important um and you could click and not click with some people too and that's part of a, the challenge or uniqueness of a two-seat airplane squadron is there are there are type a personalities and some people mesh and some people do not you, you are just doing a great job leading into my next question, which is, yeah, can you kind of frame the edges of that conversation for me? The reason I ask is I always like to ask people, you know, I don't know, we all know folks we enjoy flying with. There's just, like you talked about, that mind meld, I guess is the term we're using today. It's just someone that your personalities work well together. Yep. You can, there's nothing you can't do. And then there's the other side of it. Yep. And I'm curious if you could maybe define the corners for me, because I think sometimes those specific examples, I don't know, I listen to folks describe things. I'm like, yep, I, I want to be the opposite of that human being in every way, yeah. shape, and form. And then the other way, that's who I want to be. That's the aviator I want to be for someone else, not for myself, but to try to help someone else to help them learn or help them get something done. I spent a lot of time thinking about this because it's, it's, as an instructor, you know the same way. You're trying to break through that wall to kind of get those ideas across. And my experience was for when it clicked and didn't click, it wasn't necessarily tactical proficiency in that everybody was kind of at a basically the same level understanding the aircraft and how to operate it and how to kind of employ weapons and things like that. Now, some had way more experience at it, whether real world or not, and were better at it. But the like, you know, you're running an air to air intercept. You run your timeline. You shoot on timeline. You maneuver on timeline. You find the bad guys. You let them before they get you. It's pretty straightforward when you're winning or losing. It's actually a very cavemanish. You're either winning or losing. It's as simple as that. You're winning or losing, and so get back on winning on the timeline. Get on the happy side. So the so the tactical day to day practice and rip, you know that kind of stuff of hey we're gonna go do a couple intercepts and then go home okay well you know that became routine not routine that's the right word but you do thousands of intercepts and you practice th- i mean my gosh hundreds and hundreds of hours of dog fights uh that kind of stuff over and over again i mean that's why pilots have to do a warm-up if they don't do a dog fight in two weeks because it's a perishable skill so what i think it became was a more of a personality like there's people that are kind of jokesters or conversationalist people. And there are some people that when they strap in an airplane that they completely become a serial killer and do not even respond. Like you don't even get grunts out of them. And I kind of like, I'm a, I'm kind of a fun guy. I like to talk. I like, I, I make jokes and stuff. I have gallows humor and we were, I'm getting shot at it. I'll probably make a smart ass remark about it as I'm doing something about it. I hope. Um, and so I try to find a levy and everything. or just kind of make it fun as best I can. But if we're at work, we're at work. And some people get a little too, this is work. And so for me, I think it was always kind of a personality driven kind of thing of, hey, you know, is it time for levity and is it time for work kind of thing? And can you mix the two and kind of work as a, you know, a one unit? I don't know if that makes any sense. No, it does. Yeah. You got to read the room, right? Like you can't just bring I, yeah. a, an outlandish personality to work, exactly. but by the same token, sometimes exactly. a little levity is needed to oh, yeah. refocus the and, brain. I mean, not in the middle of an intercept, just you're, you're busy. It's more <laughs> yeah. of like, okay, in between fights, okay, yeah. what the hell was that? That was great. Or, oh my God, that was stupid, you know, or... Okay, nothing. I guess we're just going to go on the next thing. Great. Okay, great. I'm flying with a piece of cardboard. Fantastic, right? <laughs> um, especially on a cross country. You know, if you're doing nothing but, you know, you have a 100-mile leg to Key West, oh, are we going to talk? Or are we, you know, okay, I guess I'll just play with the radar. Or, hey, let's talk about where we're going to go when we go eat there. You know, that kind of thing. So, um, I think a lot of times it's easy to have a self-image. Like, you, you know what you think other people think of you if that yeah. makes any sense yeah it does. and yeah. then sometimes when you maybe i don't know again i'm big in photography video that type of thing when you hear yourself or see yourself you're like oh god that's how i come across yeah but i don't think a lot of people necessarily are very introspective maybe they are and i'm just missing it i don't think a lot of people realize how they are 
heard. Yeah. And then when they do, hopefully it's kind of a wake up call. Like, hey, man, yeah. you're supposed to play well with others and you are kind of an asshole. Uh, or not, hopefully. You know, yeah, because right? there's that's how people get call signs sometimes. Or lack <laughs> very true. And some of the call signs are very straightforward. <laughs> Indeed they are. Yeah. Uh, without being rude or, or they're not dirty. They're just, okay. You know, and that's okay because everybody's different. Everybody's wired different. And, you know, type A, type B personality. And then the end of the day, the mission comes first. It's just how you interact. And in a two-seat airplane, it's it's really, it, it doesn't have to be, I'm not levity. That's one way of looking at it. It could be just two guys, two surgeons at an operating table, you know, scalpel, scalpel, bone saw, bone saw. They're just working it. And that's fine too. And I've had those as well. Uh, I, I just think you see that with the senior junior mindset of, you know, like I said, the pilot two thing and the backseater thing where they generally get guys coming in for senior junior and it's like the most senior pilot, most junior backseaters. And they kind of kind of match them up as they get to a, like a mid-level, you know, J.O. level. And then it kind of switches between pilot back. So most senior pilots always fly with the junior NFOs and the most senior NFOs are typically stuck with the, the new guy that just checked in just to kind of be their mother-in-law for lack of a better word. I joke with students all the time. You know, as a as a backseater, whether you're a Wizzo or Evo now, you're really only doing Wizzo stuff from fights on to knock it off. And that's it. That's your Wizzo stuff. That's your day job. Well, you got to commute to work, though, and that's from engine start to checking in for the fights on and then from the knock it off to the walking away from the airplane high-fiving. Are you really doing a lot of Wizzo stuff? Are we shooting people down? No. Are we, you know, dropping them up? No. So what are you? You're a part-time Wizzo, and you're really a coach, mom, psychologist, your brother, cheerleader safety observer, NATOPS checker, safety examiner, mother-in-law. That's really what a mission commander is because the pilot does pilot stuff and you do your backseat stuff to back them up. And then when the fights come on, now you do your WISO stuff. And so you have to flip that switch, I think, a little bit. Um, so, which brings to, to an interesting point, that's one of the challenges. And I think Class A mishaps, you know, Class A mishaps of, you know, more than $2 million or a loss of life. Um, they statistically spike in two-seat airplanes, or they used to, maybe it's changed now, but it used to be, when two junior officers were in the same airplane, they had about six to 700 flight hours in that aircraft. That was the magic number where bad things would happen. Because I think that was a number where you had just enough hours to feel salty and cocky to go, man, I'm getting pretty good at this thing. But you're still young enough and dumb enough to try it, for lack of a better word. As I had one time with a guy I flew with as we were flying blue water off in the middle of nowhere, and I was probably, I think it was around six, seven hundred hours, something like that. I can't remember. And uh, he was, I think he had more. <clears throat> and he said, and, and, and I quote, hey, do you think we can drag the hook in the water? And I was dumb enough to go, I don't know. Let's see. We didn't try, but we talked about it. But for a moment, I actually had the, yeah, that's stupid. But it'd be cool how if we long, could. How below, below the airplane is the hook? I mean, a couple Not low feet? enough. No, not low no, enough. Not low enough, yeah. Oh, my gosh. So, uh, <laughs> but for a moment, I went, eh. Eh, no. Nah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. six, seven hundred hours, Class A mishaps yeah. would spike. And so, I actually, there are some CEOs that would purposely not put two JO crews together until they broke that barrier because Murphy's Law is, no, it's statistics, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Judgment has to come with that. Exactly. And sometimes the judgment is getting the crap scared out of you. Yep. Um, that's where we learn best, I think. Yeah, quite honestly. That's the <laughs> another thing I use as a backseater perspective. Uh, FAA did a study of all the black boxes of you know that they could find, and, and they compiled all the last words. And I think the two most, pardon my language, but the two most common last words that were recorded before everything went bad were, were oh, shit, and Jesus Christ. Pardon my language there, but that's FAA study. So what I talk to for perspective backseaters is I have three. Mine are those two, and watch this. Those are the three that make me perk up. What, what, what? What's going on up there? What do I need to know? What are we doing? Uh, because they're busy doing pilot stuff. I'm busy doing backseater stuff sometimes. And I want to be involved in that conversation when I hear those three things. You're going to hit the ground about, what, four to five feet behind them? Like, yeah, you, your uh, team. The only seniority, and that's another thing with senior, junior guys. And I talk about, you know, career resource management. And, and young young officers are very respectful. And they're, 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 honestly, I'm really impressed with this generation because they signed up in a time of war. Um, but they're also a little too deferential sometimes. And they, they climb into an airplane and they're basically, sir, this or that. I'm like, where does it say, sir, in a checklist? Just tell me to turn, you know, that kind of thing. We're operating an aircraft here. So uh, there's a little, the deferential thing gets a little too much to the point of, hey, man, just give me the search of the operating table. And that's what I want to hear. Just tell me to turn and I'll do it. Um, I had a point to that story, but I've lost myself. I, um, one of the things we would do, uh, joking, call it a murder board or aircraft commander board going through in the helicopter syllabus, they'll always say, hey, you know, giving you some kind of a scenario. You have the most junior co-pilot, the most junior crew chief, and then, you know, yep. you're, basically the whole point is it's all on you. You're not going to hang this on. There's a senior guy I can ask yeah. in, in the back or in the other seat for help, oh. basically. I remember what it was. 
Go ahead. Yeah, please, I, I promise I'll keep it short. But yes. the reason I mentioned that the one time I popped a motor in the 53 was with the most junior car. We have three, so it's not that big of a deal. We, <laughs> we are heavy, you. but other than that, I want them all. <laughs> it, made, it made a real big noise and a yaw kick and all that good stuff. But anyway, Ooh. most junior co-pilot, literally brand new check-in from the FRS and the brand newest crew chief. And she did great and he did great. Now I'm getting the order wrong there. He in the front seat, she in the back did wonderful. And actually, um, yeah, a lot of really great lessons learned. But the point is, those new people, sometimes they have that in-the-book knowledge, that procedural knowledge, because you might have been out of it for a little bit doing FCFs or whatever else in my case. And it's kind of nice to have, yeah, you know what, you're, you're a junior, big air quotes here, yeah, you're a junior of the aircraft, but you still brought something to the table. So the, the other side of it is, well, as a junior person, how you communicate, what you say, Absolutely. it matters. You yeah. just, Sorry. One of the great points that you, when I, when I left the RAG to go meet my squadron, one of the greatest things I heard that was a eye opener was this is the best your NATOPS knowledge is going to get because you are paid to go learn this airplane in the FRS. And now once you leave here, your job is to go do that other stuff while you have your five other ground jobs and other things. So you will never be as proficient with the NATOPS as you are now. And that's why, like you said, that brand new one is probably probably knew the page yep. and chapter. Yep. They did great. <clears throat> so, yeah, senior junior. What, what, I'm sorry, but. Uh, no, no, of course. The last part was when people talk about seniority in front seat, back seat, and I kind of emphasize, look, when the plane hits the water, the only seniority the front seat gets is they, they die one five thousandth of a second in front of you. That's it. That's in front of the line. So you need to be a crew, basically. Yeah. Common sense and good judgment. If you're flying with the air wing commander and you're basically on a, you know, a direct flight, to, you know, at flight level 280 and you have the autopilot on. You're probably not smoking and joking, you know what I mean? You know, reference and respect for the, you know, for the for the person in the office and then the rank, that kind of thing. But if you're in the middle of maneuvering to defend, pretty sure CAG does not want to hear, hey, sir, at your earliest convenience, if you don't mind, would you please uh, break right? No. Break right. Climb. Yeah, you know? yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, that's what they want to hear. They don't yeah. want that kind of stuff. So that's something that's important. Anyway, off on a tangent. No, no worries Part of the two seat, but like I said, art form, I guess you could say. Yeah, yeah. Um, cause there's a lot of art form to it and personality and, and for good another, you can have, I've heard stories of people, button heads and man, I could maybe one or two will maybe take offline, but, uh, you know, <laughs> where it's, uh, you know, when we land, I remember a guy who was like, when we land, I'm going to kick your ass. Wow. Like, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> and then not a word was spoken. I remember seeing a canopy pop open. Uh, this is the story afterwards. The canopy pop open. I saw the pilot jump out and start running. And then the NFL got after him. He was a big football player. I was like, what the hell? And they told after the story, like, yeah, he didn't say anything after that. And he, he said he was going to kill me. I was like, okay, I don't want to know what you guys did. But that, yeah. they sorted it out. <laughs> Indeed, they and did. I did that, too. I had a story, and it's a minor story. of, uh, You know, I, I had the power switch for the Aug-9 radar, and I was flying with a guy, you know, great pilot. But he was, uh, well, I just say he 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 was he wanted to fly F-18s, and so I don't think he was happy about going back to F-14s. So, um. He wanted to do everything by himself. So we were flying a night vision goggle, uh, air-to-air intercept out in Fallon. And I remember pointing north uh, at the bad guys and getting the calls and I'm on the radar. And he's looking off to the left. And he goes, I'm tally. I'm turning. Like, no, no, no. They're north. (laughs) Nope. I'm going left. Okay. That's not them. It was airline traffic basically outside the airspace. To the point where we set up for the next fight and I just put the radar in standby. And I said, uh, well, I guess you don't need me anymore. So I'm just going to enjoy the, the cloud. I'm looking, I'm looking at shooting stars and stuff. And he's like, come on, man, turn the radar. I'm like, nope. You can do it by yourself. You don't need me. And we finished the rest of that with no radar. And we went back and we talked about it. Yeah. And that's, I'll bet you did. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, okay, you want to do that? I can do that too. Yeah. There's <laughs> a reason easy. there's that second seat in the airplane. You've got to use. I enjoyed the view. Skill. It was fantastic. <laughs> I, saw, I think satellites and shooting stars. You can see Salt Lake traffic way out there. It was great. I was like, are you serious? What is yeah. this? And he was an 04 and I was an 03. And I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. No, because we're two crew members in a cockpit. Exactly. You got to bring something. Yeah. And that uh, it's something that I've had. I don't know how relevant this is, but some of the uh, experiences at 10, you know, with. You know, instructors, we all talk to each other, right? You know, hey, what do you focus on this, that, and the other thing? And a lot of times I try to be very aspirational. And yeah, okay, we're going to do what the book says. Absolutely. Like, I'm not shortchanging that. But I really want them. You know, mission commander mindset. I want you to think, be a leader. Tell me what to do. I want you to be assertive. And there are some people, oh, yeah, they'll get that later. They'll, and I, no, you need to build the reps now. You need to see it now. Because it's not just going to, oh, yeah, I'm in my F-14. All of a sudden, it all makes sense. And I'm going to be assertive. And I'm going to make decisions. No, it, it needs to start at a foundational level. And yeah. I would get... I get the feeling it probably did with you as well. Yeah, you they want to. you to take the bull by the horns. Well, you have to because when you're in that senior, when you're in that lead airplane, <laughs> when I first met uh, the top hatters, they were doing workups. And so I went to the boat with a guy named Woody, great pilot, Top Gun grad, really funny guy. And he actually 
tricked me. He got me. I'll tell that story. <clears throat> to go out to go carrier qualify. So I was just meeting them. So we went to the boat and just did three catapult shots and landings. Just say, okay, cool. You got your three. You're good. And so uh, we would do our land, shoot, land, shoot. And actually, it was kind of bad weather, and he was a great pilot. And so when we would do our cat stroke, go shooting off the front end, he would uh, he would go, all right, you ready? Here we go. And he'd salute, and we'd go shot off, and he would go, woo! I mean, on hot mic, hot, you know, on the ICS, as loud as he could. So I thought, oh, oh this is like a ride. Fast forward, the next time I did a flight, I was with the XO, and I did that on the first shot. And he was, what the shot? The- <laughs> Oh, you're supposed to be quiet, you dummy. Yeah. <laughs> so what he got me? He got me. He, I thought that was what you're supposed to do. I had a student do that to me in a spin. Oh. Right as we enter, he goes, woo. And I was like, what, the, what is going on back yeah. there? Or up there, yeah. I guess. Yeah. yeah so. What's next? When you're not, yeah, exactly. When you're not yeah. expecting it, it is a little bit. Uh... So he got me. And then I go downstairs to meet them uh, in the ready room. And I saw him like, hey, don't take your gear off. And go down the ready room. This is so dumb. And I say hi to whoever's up there. And I think I met the skipper. I can remember. And uh, they're like, all right, turn around. Go back up. Uh, you got to go jump in two or whatever. You're going to go lead a four VX sparrow only timeline, go intercept. And I'm like, okay. And the, fr- I didn't, I, my, what I said was, I think I remember I said something I'm like, can someone tell me how to get back up to the flight deck? <laughs> Cause I didn't, I just followed the pot all the way down. I had no idea where I was going. First time on the boat. Cause I met him where work ups. So I was kind of like, great. Can someone tell me how to get up to the flight deck, please? <laughs> Nice job, FNG. Friendly new guy, number three. Well, yeah, that's that's a good way to kind of get a good reputation early. Anyway, so that was uh, that was pretty exciting. And learning to fly off the boat was pretty different because you meet him during workups. So, um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. And I want to get to that next. Was that when you finished the FRS? Which squadron did you go to after uh, one? F fourteen, the top pattern. Fourteen yeah. was that at back at Oceana. Oceana, okay. A, a squadron. Yep. So we met them. I met them, and it was yeah. I finished the rag, and it was in February. January of 90, January of 99. Oh my God, I go back in time. It was so long ago. Yeah. And then we pushed off essentially a few weeks later because everything was kicking off with Desert Fox and then we went right to Kosovo. Yeah. What a way to join the squadron. Yeah. So we kicked off and went over there. So Desert Fox finished, we went out and then we basically did Kosovo, our allied force and enduring freedom. What was the mission set for the Tomcat in that, uh, in that engagement? It had just Desert Fox really kind of, I think from my history recall that they were really the first ones to get the lantern pod that, you know, the tactical targeting pod stuff working really well and do some, some rudimentary bombing. Um, and they dropped a few and they, I'm not knocking them. They did. They dropped a few. And then we got to Kosovo and we we dropped everything. We we ran out of kits. We were dropping paveway twos, paveway threes. We were we we I, I think I dropped like thirty two. I can't remember how many thousand pounds of bombs. It was that was a JG, and I was dropping bombs like crazy. We were dropping so many. We ran out of five hundred pounders. I was dropping two thousand pounders on cell phone towers just because we ran out of bombs. So everybody was dropping like crazy. We had a lot of drops, a lot of drops. Uh, I think somebody said our air wing CAG eight dropped more bombs in Kosovo than one of the CAGs did in Vietnam during rolling thunder or something crazy, some crazy amount of pounds. I can't remember what it was like. What, what, how many pounds? So it was pretty, pretty eye watering. So yeah, it was, and I'm the lantern what, pod worked well. Yeah. You, you, I was going to say, you mentioned the lantern pod, you can both target and bring all that stuff over the beach yeah. as opposed and to bring it back to the boat. And that's what was unique about the Tomcat. You can carry it off the boat and you can bring it back. Whereas sometimes people have to pick a lot of stuff off. Um, depending on what the loadouts they are, sometimes you can't bring it all on board. Okay. Um, and that, yeah, so it was it was pretty phenomenal. It was it changed the mission. Um, I think Easy mentioned about before. I knew you did a previous interview with him, but you know the, it had an AUG the AUG nine radar and it had an AUG fifteen. I can't remember what AUG stands for, but it was essentially an armament panel for air to ground. Now the weapons school guys call it air surface, by the way, but I still call it air to ground. And um, it had essentially, you know, bomb fusing, bomb arming. You can have intervals and stuff like that. You can fit, you know, nose tail kind of stuff for anybody that gets into ordnance. So it had a full setup to drop bombs. But if you asked any fighter guy up until the mid-90s to the late 90s, no self-respecting fighter guy would ever say he was an attack guy. This whole F.A. thing is ridiculous, right? No, we are separate. Oh, here we go, right? No, we don't have Swiss Army knives. You are a scalpel or you are a chainsaw, and that's it, right? And that's it. So... And I actually, I remember my first CEO, uh, Slapshot Carter, he actually said he ended up becoming an admiral. He, uh, he said, you know, as I'm standing here in the red room, I never thought I would live to see the day where I, was, I would be an attack guy. But here we are. I'm not a fighter guy. I'm a fighter attack guy because we're dropping some bombs and we dropped a lot. Um, so it was a game changer because the Tomcat was on its last legs. When it worked, it worked great. For the air-to-air stuff, it was phenomenal when it worked. Um, you know, carrying a Phoenix missile and having that long reach was, you know, you're, you're basically, you're, you're schwacking guys before they even see you on the radar, which was a lot of fun. So if we would do December training missions with different, like sometimes with countries, 
I'll never forget, we did a dissimilar thing with the Germans when they were flying the 29s And the very first thing they said was, you can't use your Phoenix. And the very first thing we said back was, fine, you can't use your home mount site. <laughs> so trade for trade. We're going to play silly games. Let's, Let's play silly that. games. Yeah, yeah, because they were like, no, because you're going to kill us all before we even find you on the radar. I'm like, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> that's literally what the airplane's designed uh, to do. That's what we do. Yeah. So when it worked like that, it worked great. And then the way we were able to use the Phoenix, uh, they were... There were so many really, really sharp guys and gals that were working uh, between the weapon school and the Top Gun and, and even all the East Coast, West Coast guys that we were still squeezing performance out of this airplane. Some would say many years past, maybe, the, the, you know, it's, it's optimal use to the point of rediscovering how to do employ the Phoenix for short range, you know, in, in close kind of missile kind of thing and shoot it off the rail active and things like that. Like, yeah, it'll work. Let's see if it'll work. Yep, it'll work. Let's do it. And that became tactics and we would test it and work it. So I was really impressed with how they 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 were creative enough to kind of ring the max performance for the max lethality of this, of this platform uh, up until retirement uh, and keep it relevant. And I think that was part of it too, was, you know, maintenance hours per flight hour became ridiculous. And that's one of the reasons it died quite honestly, and maybe rightfully so because it shouldn't be that complicated. Um, plus, plus the or- oldness of the design, things like that. But for them to be able to kind of squeeze out that much of a, of a leading role in strikes and things like that. Um, I remember, and when we were we pulled into Kosovo, and the air wing commander kind of walked, he was going to red room, red room, kind of, okay, here we go, we're going to start doing some big alpha strikes, launching everybody off, and we're just going to, this is, this is a real deal, we're going to war. Um, and he was an F-18 guy. Um, and he actually said, you know, you the top cat red rooms, you're my go-to red rooms, because I know what you guys can carry and bring back with the two-seat, with the lander pod, because at the time we had F-18 Charlies, and, and they're great airplanes, but, you know, the, the pod, the, the, the capabilities of the Nighthawk, uh, I'm sorry, the lander pot and Nighthawk, that's Marine, uh, were, were better. Plus, to bring back capability. Plus, we had several four air controllers and stuff, and I became a rudimentary fat guy by default because I was in the back seat running the pot with a guy like, dude, put it there. Okay, okay, cool. I guess we're doing this now. Um, and so that was an eye opener for me when he came in the red room and said, Yeah, you, you guys are the, you know, you're my go to. Tomcat's going to be the one leading this stuff. I'm like, wow, that must have been <laughs> probably pain for him to say. Um, because of what it could bring. So it, it revitalized the aircraft. It squeezed the lethality out of it to the point where it was it was effective as hell. Um, we were flying, God, I lost count on how many missions and how many bombs we dropped. We, we, we were flying all the time. Uh, actually, <laughs> total side note, but we still maintain the air-to-air role. So my very first flight in a combat zone, if you will, was... Let's just say, if you're going to the Super Bowl, you have your your main players on your bench, you know, and then you put your backup guys and the third stringers and the new guys on the bench, right? But at some point, maybe they'll get some flight time. So, so the first, you know, several days of all these strikes, and it was all that, you know, it as you, it should be, you know, the CO's leading the strike. It has department heads and O4s up there, and it's very salty JOs in the first couple of days worth. And all right, UFNG two and three, you guys just checked in like three weeks ago. Uh, you're going to be on the night combat air patrol from zero two to zero four in the morning. And you're just going to protect the ship just in case. <laughs> okay. Um, and then after, you know, whatever, a week or two, whatever, with 10 days, I was like, all right, that's it, crew. Everybody's, we need everybody, all hands on deck. You're all qualified. And then everybody starts dropping. And that's normal for, especially with political stuff. So my very first flight was a night, middle of the night, <laughs> flying blue, you know, drilling holes in the sky from, I think it was 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the morning, whatever it was. We hit, we hit the tanker three, yeah, so maybe even longer, like pre-tank, go out. Do hang out, come back at the tanker, go out, come back. Well, as we're flying this cap. <laughs> now, keep in mind in training, when we do air to air intercepts and dogfights, air to air intercepts, you know, you do bazillions of runs. So every time you go up, yeah, contact, single group, let's go get them, that kind of stuff. And so you're, so I'm, I'm like, this must happen every day, right? So I get up there, and sure enough, there's a contact. Hey, look at that. I found it on the pulse radar for those of you that are pulse guys. No, that's not easy, right? And it was a helicopter down low. That's also not easy. I'm very proud of that. So my first flight out there, I'm like, hey, dude, there's a contact. Yep, sure enough. And we had to go visually identify it because they're like, we don't know who this guy is. It's not supposed to be flying. It's 4 o'clock in the morning, no fly zone. Um, and we weren't allowed at the time to go below, I think it was 10 or 15, I can't remember, 15,000 feet, 10,000 feet for a small arms AAA. We didn't want to be because the AK-47s could be effective. So we weren't allowed to go below that. But we had to go visually identify this thing at night. It was a helicopter. Sure enough, it was a helicopter. We went in to go chase after it. They didn't let us go below because it was in the mountains, and they didn't want guys shooting at us. So we just kind of followed along, and then it disappeared, probably landed, went back to the boat. And I'll never forget, I think it was like a day later or something like that when I think the CEO or somebody came up to me was like, did you have a VID? Like, 
you could have got a shoot down. I'm like, yeah, doesn't that happen like every day? I, I, like I do five of them a week at the, the sim, you know? <laughs> no, dude, it's a big deal. Like, well, we couldn't go find them. We couldn't get them. But that was my first one. Like, hey, you got a contact in your first one? Like, yeah, that could have been a kill right there. Wouldn't that have been funny? <laughs> but it didn't work out. Because we never really got a kill. Which but, you, but you only know what you know, which is what you know. After no that. training, yeah, yeah exactly. I, like, this must be normal. There's contact. Just, it's just like it did in the rag. I mean, what's the difference, right? Yeah. So, stupid new guy. Um, and the other time, actually, there's only one other time where I actually almost shot missile in anger, which was uh, in Iraq against a fox bat, which was cool. Because they were doing sandbush tactics. And this was... This was um, this was 03? No, this was before. This was back in 90, 99. This was still... 99, okay. Yeah, this was after Kosovo. Then we went to Iraq. We can jump back and forth if you want to tell me about the tell oh. me about the fox bat, as uh, they say. Well, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I jumped yeah, yeah. Just, no, no, no. Just think about all. shooting missiles. Um, yeah. So I didn't get to shoot it. Uh, I, we didn't you're you're shoot closer it. than I am to have ever shot down a fox bat. It was, so we'll, it was cool. Um, I'll allow it. <laughs> they were doing... This was back when Southern Watch was still going on. Of course, yeah. And so they were... I'll be honest with you. They were... I got shot at as much or more by by AAA and Sam's in Iraq for um, Southern Watch as Kosovo, which was hot. And so when people start talking about why did we get involved, and like they were shooting at us all the damn time over there. I'm not nearly as smart on it as I should be. What uh, what is like. 23 millimeter uh what type of missiles were the iraq oh, I, I literally uh, don't know i probably their order battles all different sa6s they were using s60s they were using zoo 23s they were using everything okay um, all soviet whatever. supplied or yeah, french oh, yeah. supplied I had old stuff too yeah but okay. i mean i remember it'll seeing, still kill you yeah i remember seeing i can draw you the flat cloud right now i remember seeing one next to my airplane it was actually brownish it was weird so from whatever the explosive was this is part of that compressor salt story which will be fun. okay um, perfect yeah let's do it it was a crazy one so so Southern Watch, so they were doing sandbush tag. They would launch. They would kind of cross the line. So you'd go go check them out. They would drag us back and into a SAM, light it up, and they'd try to shoot us down. So, so Sam Bush, a Sam ambush Bush. with a surface air missile. Exactly. That's the term. So yeah. we, uh, we and I was flying with a, another JO at the time. So it was 2, two well, 0, 02 and 03, um, flying in the airplane. And uh, get a contact pop up, and I'll never forget. It was 54,000 feet. It was like Mach 1.8 accelerating, climbing with 15 right target aspect, 20 right target aspect. Like, the hell is that that thing's moving and it's high I'm like okay contact and we made the declarations whatever and the radio call for those that know radio stuff when you when you make a declaration on a, on a target you get correlation and you get the declaration back from the higher ups that are supposed to say yes that is hostile that is a bogey bandit things like that so it's being like yeah. AWAX, some kind exactly. of a, air, another airborne asset exactly and because this was political i think the AWAX even ties into like Alpha Whiskey was in charge of the battle group or the two star, whoever, would even go up to the White House. I don't know. I, beyond, beyond me, I'm just a dumb sure. too. You got to do what that voice on the radio tells you to do because exactly. they're they're seeing a bigger, broader picture than you are in that exactly. moment. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, sorry, I'm and interrupting I, you. No, no, you're not. You're exactly right. And so I call the contact out and declare them, and we hear hostile. <laughs> There's a moment of. Um, I still remember on the ICS, I was, did he just say hostile? <laughs> I think he just said hostile. Ask him again. <laughs> uh, contact about it. I just want to give him a hostile. And it was bullseye, whatever, even different call. And I remember my recollection is another voice came up on it, and I'm pretty sure it was the Admiral because I heard him go, yeah, kill him. <laughs> like, yeah, that's hostile. Holy hell. <sighs> So we, you know, after burner, we kick our two in the combat spread. We, you know, okay, we can master arm on, all that kind of stuff. And I remember we're waiting on that arm maximum shot because he was way far away. I don't want to get the numbers, but it was far, far away, even if we retired, way far away. And I'm like, okay, I think I can get this maximum range shot off this guy just a little bit more, just a little bit more. And we're hauling, but towards him, he's coming at us. Uh, we're getting to that maximum shot range. Oh, so you're beak to beak. This is not him yeah. running away. You this are, is, but this is very far away. We're okay. talking. We're talking tens of tens of tens of tens of. Okay, tens a of long way away. away. Yeah, yeah, uh, very far away. <laughs> and uh, I'm probably rough guess, maybe ten seconds to fifteen seconds away from just hitting the edge of the envelope to be able to. And I was going to push that launch button and get that Phoenix come off and see if, if nothing else, I get a shot off on this guy. And right when I was about to do it, he starts turning. Now, hindsight being 2020, we talked about it. I'm pretty sure the Iraqi Foxback guys knew the F-14 AUG-9 radar pretty well from the Iranians. So they know exactly when we lit him up with a 5,000 kilowatt radar and track wall scan, you know, that kind of stuff. He, his, his radar warning receiver is probably reverse engineer for that thing, so he knows it's an F-14. And he knows exactly or roughly what range we're going to shoot. So he turned at the perfect time. So he started turning. And to this day, I'm like, I should have pushed that damn button just to get it off the rail. But he turned, went away, and we kind of went back, and we then go in the same thing. And, okay, Master, I'm off. 
<laughs> that would have been wow. The odds of getting a kill at that range, pff, I wouldn't put money on it. Yeah. But to say I shot one, sure. Yeah. Yeah. You, you don't win if you don't play. You but know? is that part of the technique that was essentially accepted by the Iraqis that they were trying to draw you out, be it with in this case a fox bat or some other threat? Yeah. And then now that you're in the run away quickly. They can run away quickly. Yeah. But then now you're in that environment where their ground battery can engage and you. light you up. Yeah, okay. exactly. And they were doing that regularly to the point where we were we were getting all sneaky too, doing fun stuff like we would uh, we would put like a tanker in the middle of nowhere that was kind of closer, but we would have our fighters go up and turn all their squawks off and just hang out in the tanker. And so the next time the fox bat came up all of a sudden boom all those guys turn their radars on i was like ah <laughs> big surprise yeah where were they where'd they come from that's supposed to be you know, like com air or whatever like no there's f there's eight f-14s coming at you right now son good luck yeah. <laughs> so you Gosh. see them turn around and run away pretty quick uh and then they never did that stuff again so they did other stuff too but that was that was the, my recollection you mentioned the uh the compressor stall was that similar yeah so this is another one in, in iraq again and i'm flying as dash four so i'm in the back seat with another guy a good pilot good pilot solid guy uh but he's an 03 and i'm you know the 02 whatever and so we're uh we had just gone out and dropped we took out some triple a i can't remember what it was and as we're flying back the triple a is lighting us up lighting us up um to the point where i remember it's a clear blue sky day and it was so weird because like i said like the flat clouds were like they were like i could draw them they're like brownish it was weird they weren't black it was like world war ii footage and this is just a the fuse in the whatever the round we say triple a it's just a big yeah. bullet but it's barometric so basically they say at a certain altitude boom yeah. and they're hoping that that altitude that the shell goes off at is where you are exactly and they were okay. getting pretty close they were actually really close i think they were s60s i can't remember i think it was 60s anyway um, and so we're dash four of this division. And I remember vividly kind of seeing all of a sudden I'm looking out my right because I'm looking off to the left to see the flak going off underneath my left wing. And I'm, we're line one four. I remember line one four. I got triple A left nine o'clock. And then as I look back to the left, I see dash three and then two and one are going way. They're going up, up, up. We're going down. We're descending and slowing down. And now in the F-14A, the compressor stall warnings, like there was a couple of tones we didn't get in the back seat. We didn't get the AUG nine. We didn't get the uh, the AIM nine growl, and we didn't get. I didn't get the deedle deedle stuff. I don't know what was going on. If we did, I didn't hear it. I did not hear it. And so I remember looking up and I see the rest of our flight, and we're descending into the flak. And I remember going, "Dude, what are you doing?" He goes, "Oh, oh yeah, man, we had a compressor stall. I'm just relighting the left engine." I'm like what? He, he shut down the engine to restart it. And that's why we were descending and slowing down. And hence the 310 and the left 295 and the right thing. And I remember thinking, you did what? And you didn't tell me? Like, are you planning? I was like, dude, I'm busy. <laughs> like, okay. And I, was, I remember being A, scared. B, really pissed off. And C, like, all right, do what you got to do, man. Get us the hell out of here because they're aiming at us now. Because we're the tail end Charlie dipping into it, slowing down while the rest of the flight's leading away. And it was kind of like, what the, were you planning on telling me, man? <laughs> you know? Well, and the first thing my brain thinks is you have an air start envelope, and that air start envelope may be right where all that flak is, yep. i.e. the altitude We were band. descending into it to get it relit again. Oh, and God. I remember thinking, this sucks. This is not cool. You <laughs> yeah. should have, like, what, you know, what, what else he's doing, what he thinks he needs to do. And I don't fault him for that, but I was a little pedo that he didn't kind of clue me in at the time as we are descending into it. But he was busy, to be fair. So I think that's reasonable. Motor relit and uh, yeah, relit. We're here to talk about it. Yeah, and we got out there bravely. Like that was stupid. <laughs> what was that? So thank you, Brad Wendy, for that. <laughs> but that's okay because we were way up high. We were really up high. Um, and sometimes you go too high, and they don't like being up there. So I was going to say, yeah, the airplane. Uh, I mean, the engineers, the folks that made it. There's there's a, a bandwidth within which you're going to operate the damn thing, yeah. and outside of that, it's kind of at your uh, yeah at your peril, yeah. high or low. You just got to be. You treat it with respect, and yeah. it will treat you well. If you don't treat it with respect, it'll, it'll bite you. Yeah, and it'll tell you why. So you mentioned Kosovo, and you talked about, uh, obviously, a pretty cool story there. But what do you remember what night one? Was there a night one of y'all's? Uh, you talked about, obviously, Skipper was flying, you know, leading the leading yep. the pack when that was going on. But was there a, I don't know, I don't think that war is as well known, maybe as a Desert Storm or Iraq or Afghanistan or anything else. No, not really. Yeah, for, for someone that was actually there, what can you tell me about it? So I, I'm just guessing what I've read online, essentially. From well, the first I watched the first day because we stay on the boat, and then I did that oh dark thirty kind of cap to watch them go have fun, whatever. And they were doing some massive strikes, you know, all the airplanes going off the front end, going in. They were taking out, I think it was some. Uh, it's an airfield, right? Uh, airfields in Pristina, and they also did some stuff, also some pole mill stuff, took out some fuel tanks and things like that, and like the big uh, storage facilities to kind of take away their ability to fight. 
Uh, so those guys all came back and were watching like, okay, I got to go do my cap now. I wish I could watch the tapes. Um, but it was, it was, it was real deal full. What my, my impression from all that stuff was, it was actually kind of neat because we settled into a routine after a while where we were dro- we were going every day, multiple times a day for a long time. Um, I can't remember the exact number of days, but it was, it's, it was, I remember vividly sitting there going, is this, is this what it was like to be like on Yankee station in Vietnam or like on a carrier in World War II where all you did was eat, sleep and wake up, brief, go fly, blow stuff up, come back and repeat. And w- what was great about the relationship we had was, uh, we had kind of one of those, you know, patent speech kind of moments kind of thing, which is great natural leadership kind of stuff. Again, Slapshot Carter, great guy. Um, and he said, look, here's, okay, rule number one, uh, you have, you know, all your ground jobs, you know, you have collateral duties as an officer and getting a legal officer. And the young guys always have the junky ones like legal and first lieutenant and oh my gosh, right? He said, you will take all of your paperwork and all your jobs. You're officially done with those. You will hand all that stuff to your chiefs and LPOs, your leading petty officers, and you will focus solely on sleeping, eating, and flying, and briefing, and blowing stuff up. Your job will be to be a killer. You are not going to do paperwork. And I remember thinking, yay, because I was a legal officer. Here you go. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. No more administrative separations for me, please. Um, and I was like, oh, that's a brilliant move, because they get, your job is to do one thing, and that's what you will do. Um, and I thought that was brilliant. Um, and then we got to that routine to the point, not a routine where it was like, oh, yeah, yawn, another. No, it was kind of like, all right, here we go again. And you just got into a groove where you knew what was coming, how fast it would take, where the tankers would be, and kind of what the missions were going to be. And you got to the planning stages, and it was more quicker, efficient. We'd go out there, go find the stuff. We were, we, we were running out of targets. We were taking so many things out. Um, so I think that point, I remember sitting there in the writer room as we are kind of sitting there with no patches on going, all right, time to go again. All right, go get your gun. Okay, get the rounds. Stick it in. Let's go. Let's go out. And it was like, yep, this, was this what it was like? You know, you just kind of hit that the groove. Could you describe maybe like a typical flight, a typical sortie? Yeah, it depends on the mission. It depends on where we of were. Course, so if the caps were the caps, like I talked about. Yep, air to air. You're up there, and there to just intercept. Hanging out and, yeah. and, and, and there was so there's only other one air to air thing I had. Most of the time was boring. A lot of times nothing goes on because nobody's going to try to take on a carrier, usually in theory. Um, and then once the the very end, so the helicopter very beginning is my personal experience, and at the very very end, excuse me. Uh, when I think it was kind of the, it was like the ceasefire was kind of happening, and so the war was kind of winding down to be over basically to the point where okay now the, the Serbs were going to actually go fly you know they were going to move some of the aircraft and move them back up to north up north, and I was on the cap uh, and watching them take take off and start going north. I remember calling them out. <laughs> it was funny. I called them out on the radar. Uh, like yep, those are the, yep. That's it. You know, keep an eye on them. They're supposed to go that way. They're supposed to do that. And I remember an A ten guy checked in because he wanted to like try to commit. Like, what do you? No, good luck, dude. Um, so that's the only time I saw the airborne. Otherwise, there was a lot of different things we did. Um, forward air controllers, airborne's fat caves, we were working stuff. We would do like kill boxes, and so they would set up regions and areas where they would set up these kill boxes and kind of do. And there's different types of missions, like you know, closer support things like that. There weren't any troops on the ground, so we didn't have anything like that. Early on, there were some that later on that kind of rolled into Pristina Airfield. Actually, the Russians rolled in at one point. That was crazy. Um, and uh, but we didn't. It was really mostly for us to kind of set up kill boxes and essentially find stuff and blow targets up. If we saw a target's opportunity, we'd take them out. So I did uh, did a bunch of uh, interdiction missions and things like that. Hey, today we're going to go take out this command and control building. Hey, this one's going to be a hey, line of communication. So some cell phone towers and things like that. Um, or it could be bunkers and things like that. And it, it got to the point where we were just picking anything we could find and going back and maybe making sure the bunker was out, you know, that kind of thing, because we didn't want to carry 2,000 pounders back to the boat. Um, so typical day, we, you know, yeah, you brief it up. You get, uh, quite honestly, what was funny about it was, depending on where we were early on or later, we weren't doing a whole lot of daytime flying uh, because you're easier to see. So I remember looking at my logbook, and there's a lot of, you know, green ink and red ink, uh, you know, for night vision goggle and combat time, and it's it's mostly green and red, and then a little bit of the daytime stuff, basically. So <laughs> uh, all the JOs were vampires. I think I ate breakfast on the USS Theodore Roosevelt. I think I ate breakfast three times, and two of those were because I rolled in from the night before. Because otherwise, you slept all day. You woke up at the crack of whatever, and then you had your you know lunch, dinner stuff, mid rats, and then you, you hit the rack after you, you know, whatever, and so you slept during the day. We're all vampires. Um, uh, yeah, launch off the front end. I remember, you know, you usually had a pre-tank, top off, go in country, and based on whatever mission was, either find a strike and hit it, come back, tank and hit the boat, or it'd be kind of swapping out with other guys, and especially if we were doing, like, the, the, the forward air controller stuff where you'd be on station for a longer time. 
And then usually we carry, I think it'd be like uh, essentially uh, six, 500 pounders, I something, something like that. More 500 pounders, smaller ones, because you'd be marking targets for other guys to hit. So you're marking um, with a 500 pound bomb? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. We, Not a we, smoke rocket or a, no, we, an Islid. We're you're not marking with a bomb. Yeah, we had Islids, to be honest okay. with you. Uh, but to be honest with you, I, I hated them. I didn't like them because we had to wear like Obi Wan goggles because we were worried about the reflection to blind us and stuff. And I tried it once. I didn't like it. This so is I, a super powerful laser, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I didn't. I, maybe other guys used it, but I never did. Um, and so I just remember like, nah, it's just easy to look out the window and put a 500 pounder on it. They're going to figure out where it is pretty quickly. Indeed, they are. Um, yeah. And yeah, hit that. Okay, yeah. got it. Um, so we did a bunch of that kind of stuff. Um, and then you know, pre tank, mid tank, a couple times or post, and then come back to the boat and. What's that duration in terms of a sortie duration? Uh, depending, I would say probably averaging probably no more four. Four and a half tops, I think. I had one seven point two hour one in my logbook. Uh, was a, <laughs> that was a cap, which was we launch pre tank, go out cap, boring mid tank, go back to the cap, boring, come back, and we're supposed to tank to go back to the boat just to top off to the boat, and our relief cap maintenance canceled, so we had to take their cap and do it again. So I think it was what five or six times on the basket, uh, two back-to-back caps. All I remember is, you know, when you carry these relief bags that you can urinate in. Piddle pack, yeah. Yep, I, I filled two of those and I had three Snickers bars. That was my 7.2 hour day. Oh my gosh. That was a long day. Yeah, I bet and it we was. We didn't see a single damn thing. <laughs> was there, a, well, again, we're not gonna speak about anything we can, but was there a pretty healthy, decent, whatever you wanna call it, was there an air-to-air threat that you all were concerned about or was it just yeah. one of these? Yeah, okay, uh, and to be honest with you, the Air Force did a, <laughs> quite honestly, with complete man crushed envy, envy. Um, you know, there were a couple of guys in Strike and the Eagles, rather, Charlie guys, that got a couple kills, yeah. Um, okay. And they were getting some MiG-29s and stuff, like, ooh, <laughs> wow, all right. So the concern would be one of those guys getting airborne, either taking y'all out or going out to the carrier and doing, yeah. doing something worse? I'd be impressed if the MiG-29 had the gas go all the way out to the boat, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, good point. <laughs> But, uh, but, yeah, they were they were getting some kills. Um, okay. so, so there was one early on. So that's the reason why. Like, it's not something that can be ignored. You have to have some oh, yeah. kind of an air-to-air yeah. if deterrence up there. You need something to land on when you come back. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a ship defense. I, I belittle the captain, but it's 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 critical because yeah. if something gets through and all you – as the Argentinians taught the Brits and the Falklands, you know, all you need is one guy getting in below 550 feet, whatever it is, 20 feet. That's all you need. And then they can, they can shoot whatever they need next to set, and there you go. You have nowhere to land. There goes your stereo, right? Yeah. You're swimming. So, uh, so it's still critical. Yeah. Gotcha. Was it something that uh, you mentioned the Tom Cake menu was pretty new to the air to ground role? Was it something that the community accepted with gusto? Or like you mentioned, there was some guy yeah, that said. I think so. Yeah, we, because you knew that was the new place. Yeah, in, in the, the fleet. FRS, because we were still dropping dumb bombs. It actually was a pretty capable dumb bomber. I can say, oh, really? you know, yeah, circular probability was actually pretty tight for the rudimentary, you know, HUD that it had. Uh, was it as great as a Hornet? No, maybe not. But in the hands of the right person, as. <clears throat> What's that great line is, uh, as well, Von, von Bokey Bach, he's one of those German World War One aces, and he had a great quote, which was, it's not the box, it's the man in the box. And I remember there's a Top Gun class, side note, you know, they, they give a gift to the Oak Club, and usually there's like a little quote or saying or whatever, and it was hilarious. It said, no, it's it's not the man in the box, it's the box. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, awesome. uh, yeah, so even the right hands and the competent person, they could, they could really they were pretty good with it so we were doing that kind of stuff anyway i was learning even the rag you know to do that and uh and then finally kind of just getting we didn't have the lander pod in in the frs when i was there so the first time i turned my lander pod on was actually the first time i dropped an anger yeah really yeah we actually launched as a spare total side note this is kind of funny no no pressure i was flying with a gentleman yeah it was a great 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 pilot former blue angel great pilot ended up being a co of a squadron and we were the turning spare on deck and one of the guys fell out, so we launched as the lead. Uh, so I turned the first time I turned, and so we go. Long story short, we go out and go find a bomb, a bridge, and we I hit the bridge, and my dash two's pod had some issues, so we did a buddy lays buddy bomb. So I basically buddy lays them in, and then on the way back to the boat, I was like, oh, by the way, that's pretty cool. That's the first time I turned a lander pod on, and he was like, what? <laughs> Oh, didn't I mention that? I'm glad you told me this now. Yeah, and he was like, "What? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It, wow. What's the big deal? Like, the, what? You, what? <laughs> but you know what that speaks to truly is the training, training. and the preparation. And I assume there was probably some kind of simulator. And there clearly, was, yeah, like, was, yeah. And so where it, the mailbox was there was a little thing with a joystick and a little room yeah, screen. I just yeah. played with it over and over and over again. So yeah. I'm not trying to take anything away from that story, but what I'll say is you had it was the first time you turned it on for real, but you had great preparation and great training ahead so. of time. And I got lucky. <laughs> I Can't I discount luck for sure. Yeah, that luck is good. What else? So you talked about. Obviously, we've got the Tomcats on the boat. We've got the Hornets. Were you, as I understand it, you were essentially buddy lazing for them, right? You were helping. They yeah. were bringing bombs and back over the beach, and then you guys were and then designating other people them. also. Remember, because we were doing killbox stuff, so we were bringing guys. I remember at one point, one of not me, but 
one of our other fat gays. Was, there's a great video of it, too, because he brought in a B1 that was loaded, loaded with dumb bombs. And he basically brought them, like, in a valley run. And you see, I mean, it's just something out of Apocalypse Now. It's awesome. So, yeah. Yeah. And you talked about you were not a qualified JTAC, correct? You essentially learned on the job. Nope, but because I was a junior guy, who am I flying with? The senior dude and the senior guy. And pretty much all of them were pretty sharp guys when they weren't doing other things. So I was like, guess what? You're going to help me run the pod, and I'm going to do this stuff from up front. I'm like, I guess I'm going to learn. <laughs> the reason I mentioned that, though, that is such a, I mean, air to air, sure. Yeah, you can take another airplane, right? It's maybe another one or person, two other people. Yeah. It's an airline or more than that. But we know what I'm getting at. Um, air to ground, yeah. There, and you mentioned there's not other people. There was not U.S. troops in contact on the ground, not right? Then, yeah. But there's still innocent people. There's still people that we don't want to kill. Yeah. And yet you're essentially learning that, like you talked about, with that great training with those folks that have that knowledge and skill set. But still a big, you know, big weight on your shoulder, so to speak. Yeah, I, uh, I didn't have a problem. If I wasn't one hundred percent sure of a target, I was not going to drop, and I had no problem bringing bombs back to the boat. I didn't care. I did not care. Uh, we can come back tomorrow. So there were a couple times where it was like, "What the heck is that? Is that a car? Is that a? I don't know. Is that a bus? Is that a minivan? Is that a bunch of kids? I don't. So when in doubt, don't drop. It's as simple as that. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. I know we we use Hollywood a lot of times to define our expectations of military aviators, and there's this. Oh, God, I don't even know what I want to call it or define it. But uh, in practice, everyone I've known exactly says what you just said a moment ago. When in doubt, you're not going to do the thing. You're no. going to come back and you know err on the side. Frankly, air crews putting their lives at risk yeah. to err on the side of, of caution to yeah. not hurt someone on the ground. Yeah, that could cause some sleepless nights that you don't want to have. And it's not worth it. Exactly. We can come back tomorrow with more friends. Yep. That's fine. How long of a period were you guys with the carrier on the line for that? Oh, my gosh. Was it? I can't. I don't want to quote a number. I can't uh, remember. Ballpark. It, it yeah. was a blur. Um, it was... Oh my gosh was it three months maybe more something like that four months something like that because yeah we got out there we left in february pushed off and they really kicked off i remember may june july and i think by july august we were on our way to the gulf yeah so it was maybe three months something like that two and a half three months i can't remember 50 something days 60 something what days. a way to arrive to a squadron and experiences for that first th i mean there's people that go their whole careers and never have that level of experience and exposure right so i remember coming back from that cruise still as an fng friendly new guy for like a better word right i mean i've only been in a squadron you know that one cruise uh still a jg and i remember we went for some debriefs with the weapon school guys and they're all great they're really smart and um we were talking about what things we were doing with the pod, like guiding bombs, and you can kind of you can fly them in sometimes. So we got we got to the point where we're kind of fly, flying them into things and hitting things, and well, well, you can't do that. You, you, you can't do that. And the book says you can only your slew rate's only so many degrees per second. I'm like, well, here's a video of me doing it right now. And I remember one of the engineers made a joke, and I don't know if he was joking. He actually said, "Well, that may work in practice, but will it work in theory?" Or something like that. Like, dude, here's the video. <laughs> so it was surreal. I remember being at the Ocean at Oak Club, and this was one of those moments. Like, okay, cool. This is. I think I'm getting it because I was still learning every day. Where I was standing at the Oak Club, and I remember one or two of the guys with the patches on their shoulders, and they were the subdomatic experts, and they were like asking me the questions, like I was the subject. Like, no, I just did it. I'm not an expert, but let me show you what I did and what I did, kind of stuff. And it was just surreal, kind of feeling like, okay, maybe I'm, I'm just a dumb JG, but I have some combat experience, and now I can. Wow, okay, these guys are asking my opinion. Wow, what is that like? And that was a great feeling. Great feeling. It was a great yeah. feeling. Yeah. And we're like, yeah, we did it. Here, let me show you the video. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. And I think they changed books after that. Um, and all of us were doing it. It's not just me. It was all of us. We were, I was learning from the best guys. All our guys in the squadron were just sharp as hell. Um, so all I had to do was kind of hang on and copy them. And it worked out well. After that cruise, where'd you go next? Uh, finished that up and came to VT-86 as an instructor at uh, Pensacola here. Came uh, as a young lieutenant. Yeah. Real quick, sorry. Oh, uh, after that cruise. Oh, you, cruise. You spent more time. Yeah, yeah we'll finish, I can, yeah, I can finish up the cruise and started work up, switched over to the Enterprise. And ah, started work okay. ups for that. Yeah, so came back to Oceana, started work ups for the Enterprise. Um, did a bunch of other different stuff. And then basically, it was, I just called him. It was time to go. So uh, it was time for me to move on and do bigger and better things, right? Uh, so right before they left in, oh, uh, gosh, what was it? October of 2000 i got orders to the vt86 and then they were doing workups up until and then when september 11th kicked off those guys were out in the, out in the leading way while i was in pensacola uh 2000 yeah so 2001 yeah 2001 Talking about 9 so when i got yeah. to when i got to pensacola yeah so i left and and came to vt86 as an instructor but that wasn't your last flight in the tomcat correct that was that was that was yeah, it that was what it. was that last flight was it uh, was it hard to step away uh yeah and it was a good flight and i still remember it we were doing workups uh in and we were in fallon uh, and I'll never forget. It was actually this was actually really cool. It was uh, the pieces all came together for me. I thought it felt good, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, it was a strike. I remember we doing a we we planned to brief the strike where it was a low level strike where we fought our way in, shot some guys down, simulated, 
put our bombs on the target, you know, fought our way out, shot them down. And it was like, it went as briefed to the degree that it could go because every flight never does that. But like we did, we bombs on target on time, took out all the red threats, no blue threats, no blue losses and came back. And I remember going to the debrief, I think the mission was like a 1.6 or 1.7 hour mission. And I remember being in the tank over there for like four and a half hours. This was a Friday. I remember it being a Friday. I remember thinking, everybody's at the Oak Club now drinking. We won, right? Why are we still here? You know, like, no, they're, they're still peeling apart the end. I'm like, but we won, right? Like, look, what are we, we didn't get, look, can we go now? <laughs> that part does not make it into movies. So that, was, that learning, that debrief, it that was, intense. You know, yeah. no, you yeah. don't know. It's, it's an autopsy. I mean, they get to the, when they say to the, it's rightfully so. To can you give movies. an example, just out of curiosity? Yeah. So, for example, you can go back, uh, here's one example. So, Aug 9 radar, track wall scan had like a 2.15 second frame rate update kind of thing. So, you'd move it and do scans on things. And they would sit there and play your radar tape and time it. And go, that, that wasn't 2.15 seconds. You didn't give it a chance to give it full sweep. Like, what? Yeah, if your four bar should be 8.16255 seconds. That was only 8.24. I'm like, oh, my. And that's the level of detail. These and just to be get. clear, you're under G, you're maneuvering, you're making radio and, calls, and you're trying to maintain SA, and, and that's the level of debrief. That you get. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and more. And nowadays with the modern stuff, it's even better because you have everything. You have SA to everything, everything that the, the planes are doing and what they're doing and what their shots are and stuff like that. So it's pretty, it's pretty effective. Yeah. That's awesome. So it's, I think it, what it also does, I think it maybe helps streamline the process a little bit. One would uh, help. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and makes it way more effective. So it's pretty eye water. I remember sitting, you know, sitting in some of these debriefs for radar stuff and sit there going, wow, these guys are really smart. <laughs> these guys are really good at what they do. Yeah. It's, it makes you, when I, the first time I got to the unit, uh, as a reserve guy to go do this stuff, this what, four years ago now, five, whatever, four, I remember sitting at the flying wall in the first major debrief sitting in the tank for the first time in a long time. Cause I was an old Tomcat guy. Right. And I remember sitting there thinking, wow, these, the Republic's going to be fine. We're going to be okay. We will beat the crap out of whoever wants to fight us. I'm yeah. not worried now. I was worried. I'm not worried anymore. <laughs> They're good. That's <laughs> They're good really to hear. good. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, wow, even our dumb guys are smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was impressive. They're okay. really, really so that, that wraps up the Tomcat. Yeah. Now we're moving on. You talked about VT-86. Yeah. What airplanes were, uh, was it still uh, T2? T2 and the uh, T-39. T-39. Yeah. So, so the same thing. I got to be an instructor in yeah. the jump seat and bag hops in the T2 because we were all certified to fly that thing and get some good flight time and, uh, you know, keep current and stuff. So Sure. I bagged a bunch of time in the T2 just, just to sit the back and screw around and, and uh, just stay current plus bull Gs and things like that. Um, Did you consciously spend, oh, we talked about it earlier, as an instructor, hey, this is the style I want to have. This is the, you know, I, we always jokingly say you, you want the students subconsciously, you want them to be like you. You want them to learn from your experiences, not make the same mistakes you did, and then go out and do great things. Was that a, a kind of a distinct feeling you had? Absolutely, absolutely. Because I, I remember like yesterday all the goofy and dumb things I did as a student very like yesterday vividly especially sitting here in the same buildings and sitting in the same airport and runways um so so absolutely you'll always learn from other people's you know misfortunes and mistakes and carelessness and whatever nate tops is written in blood and all those great lines so so it's a conscious decision to kind of I, sh- I i don't hold anything back i share everything i can with these guys and gals as much as i can i don't i, I give them the i treat them like they're a jo just checking into my squadron um whether as a, as a instructor when I was wearing a flight suit or as a contract guy right now, yeah, there is a separation obviously, but I know I'm, you know, I, you will go out and you will, I give you everything I've got in my brain because anything I miss, you know, and something happens to you, I take personal responsibility for it. That's kind of the way I look at it. So actually when I had the, uh, the 86, uh, the, the, the reserve squadron, when I was CEO, I, you know, mission statement, CEO's letter, whatever, I just had one statement and it boiled down to it. Literally all it said was, um, it's a famous quote that floats around. Uh, anytime there's a, we hear about an air crew, you know, mishap, um, that air crew took the sum of their knowledge and experience and they bet their lives on it. And the fact that, the, that it happened wasn't stupidity. It was a tragedy. And every single person and peer or, or friend or colleague or coworker or co-flyer or whatever you want to call it that had any interaction with them at any time influenced that judgment. So a little piece of them goes, a little piece of us goes too. I take it personally. As oh, you should. Yeah. No, I, I think that's the greatest attitude yeah. to have. Yeah. So I give them everything, and which means I don't hold back here. I let them know. I let them know. Yeah, that's not good. You suck today. You know, that kind of thing. But yeah. here's why. Here's how we fix it. Yes, so. exactly. You need to hear that. Sometimes, yeah. I'm sure you heard the term regression, right? So I had a student, a yeah. uh, quick example for a warm-up flight, an instrument flight. Hadn't flown in X amount of days, and I was actually kind of surprised they did okay, and I told them that in the debrief. Luck of the flight schedule, right? We're on to fly the actual, the advancing X the next day. 
it was not good. Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of said, look, man, maybe I was a little too positive with you in the, uh, in, in yesterday's debrief, but yes. today it's not going to be a similar experience. And I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, envy that. I don't want that. But by the same token, um, yeah, we're not, uh, we're not, we're not moving in the direction we needed to. We're not as good as we were yesterday. Yeah. And that was the most frustrating thing in my mind was, what did I do? What did I exactly? Yeah. Yes, like, well, man, is my reputation now that you know I'm going to yeah. give you you know great marks, and now I just but I don't have to work with that guy. Yeah. That's not what I want you to think. Yeah. And it's but like you know, it's, the flip side of that is though, you know, if you take personal responsibility, you almost feel bad when somebody's not doing as well. That means you can also take a little credit for when they're kicking ass a little bit, and that's the greatest feeling in the world as an instructor and a teacher is when you see them do well, and not only that, go on to succeed and do bigger, better things. That's probably one of the highlights. The best part of the job is, especially as a reserve guy now, going out and doing fleet stuff with the Raider guys and, and seeing them. So, you know, I'm at the Fallon Oak Club grabbing a beer, and all of a sudden I look over and I'll see a lieutenant or a lieutenant commander. And now that I'm old, way old, I've been doing this too long, I'll see guys with, you know, commanders, uh, you know, basically leaves on their shoulders and CO on the patch. Like, holy crap, you're CO. That's fantastic. How you doing? Like, you, yeah, yeah, rocking and rolling. Man, that's, I'm so proud. You know, it's just great to see them do well. So, yeah, that's a great point. That's the highlight. There's a, <laughs> both sides of it, the good and the bad. Yep, yeah. absolutely. How long at 86 for that tour? Uh, I did uh, 2000 to 2000, so two years. Um, and then from 02 to 04, uh, yeah, so two years doing that, and then two years at NATO Greece as a staff officer, which that's going to be a whole other podcast. Okay. Of, okay. But I was going to say, before we get to Greece, you mentioned oh, 2000 to 2002, right? Yeah, sorry, did I go backwards. Yeah. No, no, you're good. Something pretty seminal happened in the middle of those two years. Where were you on uh, 2000, uh, uh, 9-11, 2001? On 9-11. VT-86 Key West debt. You were in Key West. I was, I was in the Fly Navy building, and I was pulling on my boots to go in for a brief for an air-to-air mission. And had the news on and saw the second plane hit. And immediately knew, yep, holy crap. And my brother at the time uh, was actually living in New Jersey, and he worked in Midtown Manhattan. And actually, the day of, he was supposed to have a meeting in one of the towers. So we cancel all our flights, go we go in. And I basically spent the rest of the day trying to call him. And, of course, all the cell phones and whatever phones were all down, whatever kind of thing. So I thought my brother was dead. Um For probably, I don't know, nine hours after that, ten hours, because he had to do, he was with the people that had to walk leave and walk across the bridge he was at another building doing something else he didn't go to the tower and he had to leave manhattan when they opened all the bridges for people to walk over because it was like you guys got to go and so it took him all day to get home and then finally finally got word that he was okay and i was i was done and i was yeah. pissed i was pissed <laughs> and so that's when it kicked off yeah i'll never forget that no we're gonna have that moment you were in the military before 9 11 you saw that pre g watt you know, naval aviation, mm-hmm. and after. Mm-hmm. And the reason I ask that question, the reason I try to kind of break the two up, was there a distinct difference? You know, now there's no question in anyone's mind what the mission is, what we're going to go to do, as opposed to like, I'll be honest, there are plenty of people if I said, hey, I, I, I interviewed a guy today that you know, flew Tomcats over Bosnia, they'd say Bosnia where? They wouldn't have known that that, and I'm not, not trying to shortchange it, and please don't think that that's what no, I'm saying, no. but not a lot of the American conscious, I think, was dedicated toward understanding all the things that our military is doing out in the world. But after 9-11, there was no question in anyone's mind. Right. Do you remember the difference? Do you Is there a distinct difference, or was there one at all? Maybe there I re- wasn't. I remember the mindset of guys, as a young guy, and I was seen the post you know reduction in forces so the rifts from the early you know 91 whatever kind of stuff where they were literally just shedding all these guys left and right the rifts were brutal from my understanding so the people that were my instructors were the ones that survived it uh, and the rifts were bad and airlines were good so i remember very distinctly that guys were kind of like you know pre 9 11 you know and they're like I, if i want to stay in this because i want to do this otherwise i'm gonna get an airline job and then i know several guys that had already submitted letters of resignation and had already kind of worked the process and the second the towers fell were like nope pull it i'm back i'm not going um like good for you <laughs> right so so i think the mindset was the post rift survivors became you got to want to do this you got to want to be here and you got to maybe i don't know earn it that's not the right word and then it became okay now we need to do this because we finally this is yeah we need to do this This is not this little riffraff kind of stuff of you know random country of the week kind of thing it's they're picking on us now it's our turn so yeah there was a paradigm shift when it came to that that's why i give credit to all the young you know young jos that you know all these guys and gals they signed up in the time of war you know so they know what they're getting into you know they don't know what they get into when they get in the same with me (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Two different uh, battle spaces, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I'm worse. Yeah. <laughs> After your first time in 86, where'd you go back? You said Greece? Yeah, NATO Greece. NATO Greece. Sea tour, two oh, years. Uh, the only bad part about it was I had to wear khakis every day. 
Uh, oh, that's a punishment uh, in and of itself. The good part yeah. was it was a Greece. I was a JO in Greece, um, basically on a on a century life word, you know, European shore duty where where I had bosses that were phenomenal. Uh, Greece and that whole experience as NATO guy was very unique. As aviators, you get to the point where you 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 may not be an expert in something, but give me fifteen minutes and you will be. And so I went there as a J five plans policy guy. I didn't even know what the hell J five was. I'm like, I'll figure it out. Uh, as most of us do. Or what's my job? I'll figure it out. Um, and I worked the staff job kind of thing for Article 5 and Article 5 wartime. So NATO, for lack of a better term, is uh, partner nations all together. And if uh, Article 5 means if somebody invades one of the partner nations, you have now declared war on everybody in there. Non-Article 5 operations, which is what we've predominantly done up to including you know everything we've done, is operations other than war, which means, you know, crisis response operations, peacekeeping operations, et cetera, et cetera, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so we did a little bit of that. Mostly it was all details and planning, and we would go to exercises in schools. And I volunteer for every TDY, temporary duty I can get. Uh, my best set of orders I ever got was it was, uh, you know, in Greece, and I'm there, and I have a Jeep Wrangler, having a good old time, top off from like February till October. Uh, living, living the dude life, which is great. And then uh, my boss was a German lieutenant colonel, marathon runner, great guy, uh, armor, armor guy, and uh, excuse me, artillery guy. And uh, he goes, Millie, you know, we have a exercise. Uh, you have to go to uh, Bavaria for the NATO school, and then there's a weekend, and there's an uh, exercise in Italy. You have to go to, so it's like two and a half weeks, and then a weekend, and two and a half weeks. And he goes, uh, so you're going to go to both, right? I'm like, sure, I'll go. Yes, sir, I'll go. No problem. He goes, well. Okay, go ahead. And I said, well, I better go plan the, he goes, you know, plan the flights. He goes, why? Just take leave. Take your Jeep. I'll see you. I'll see you in two months. What? <laughs> so he's like, yeah, go. So I loaded up the Jeep and I basically drove the boot of, you know, Greece all the way up to um, Italy, the boot, to the ferry all the way up across through the freaking Brenner Pass and up through the Alps and all that kind of stuff. Went up into Bavaria, did the school kind of thing, went skiing a bunch, came back. Went to Italy. And so it, I was gone for like six weeks. A couple different things, whatever, and I remember just the whole. And I even got mileage. Reimbursed for the mileage. Yeah. Wow. And I was like, this is the. He's like, you're, you, you, you need to go. You go see Europe. And I'll see you next month. I'm like, oh, I love you. Wow. <laughs> great. So that was a very, and it was great. The school, the NATO school, was fantastic. It was a really professional place. I learned a lot. It was really neat working with so many international officers from so many different countries, uh, coming as a young JO, especially because I was an O three at that point. Um, and, and kind of seeing how other people operate and, and not taking for granted what we have to. Um, so that was a very eye-opening, broadening experience and also making me appreciate more what we did. Uh, and it also made me appreciate you know, how hard NATO is. NATO's not easy. NATO's politics. NATO is, if you can get everybody together on time at the meeting, you're already 90% there. You're talking about, it's hard. NATO is hard to get it to work. Uh, not, not because of uh, individuals that work there. All the individual staff officers were fantastic. And usually they pick their best guys and gals to do this stuff. So when you're working with some real pros, uh, it's it's the political aspect and the sides of it. That, and the higher ups and they, they do their thing. So how much involvement they get into in the planning. And anyway, so it was just very unique perspective seeing all that stuff. I bet. Because uh, that also took us into, we ended up, I ended up doing, <laughs> while I'm out there, I ended up getting tagged for an eight month deployment to uh, Skopje, Macedonia, uh, to go work with the NATO uh, element that was there. Uh, kind of like, a, the, you know, they have K4, S4, that kind of thing, K- K- Kosovo forces, and the S4, uh, what they all stood for. And so we were standing up that little contingent there. It was very small. It was in a shoe factory. They built barracks in it. And I was there as the, <laughs> uh, oh, my gosh, the public, oh, what was my title? Basically, I was a media guy. <laughs> So I was the military spokesman for NATO forces Skopje, Macedonia. I worked for a civilian guy that was a former army guy that was a professional spokesman. I'm like, you sure you want me to do these? I'll do the press conference. I'm okay, you know, but this is not my job. I'm an aviator, but okay. And so that became hey, your aviator. You'll figure it out. So I've been eight months doing media stuff and working with the media cell and doing all that kind of stuff, which was really bizarre but living there was interesting you say bizarre can you give me an example what uh what made it so challenging um well uh, because my mom and dad both were from the former yugoslavia i still speak the language so and it's a little dialects difference but so i could get along okay but i wasn't doing press conferences in that because i would probably start a war so uh but it was just neat to be able to kind of go downtown and meet people after hours and talk or just talk to the professionals and 
Oh, you speak. Oh, and they see the name. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're American. Yes. <laughs> yes, I am. A little bit different connection, uh, though, to the people. It, when, it, I, yeah. think it, I, think, I think it made it easier uh, to kind of connect with people instead of, oh, you, you know, the dumb American. I'm like, come on. you know. I had an experience in Bahrain where uh, we had someone that spoke a little bit of uh, the, lo- the local language. And uh, we were speaking with, you know, basically a lot of the native speakers. They're, they're talking and then they'll have someone speak in English to us. Yeah. And that person like that, that's not what they're telling you. Oh, oh yeah. really? No, no, oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so. it, it was helpful. And if, if nothing else, it just, I think, it established relationships. And that's yes, what it all yes. is, relationships. So yeah. so that was neat. Um, yeah, so finished that up uh, and then went back to the NATO headquarters just in time to close it up because they shut it down. So it was not the plank owner, but the plank puller, I guess, whatever. <laughs> Planks have to go somewhere. Which apparently. worked out right in time for me to get orders to come. And I worked a drug deal to get back to VT86 because I had really? a house here in Pensacola. Okay. Um, and it was literally the week of Hurricane Ivan. Tell so, me about Hurricane Ivan. I've only read about it. I'd oh, love to hear about so it. So bags are packed. All my household goods are shipped. I'm literally staying at the house of a buddy of mine. Uh, John Penny passed away. Great guy, army guy. Um, plane ticket in hand. I'm supposed to leave within a day or two, and I'm watching the news. Hey, there's a hurricane heading towards Pensacola. And then sure enough, it hit. And I'm like, I guess I'm staying in Greece. I have literally a suitcase. I have nothing else. And I remember calling the CEO at the time, Special Ed, and was like, hey, you know, what do I do? He's like, stay. We have nothing. There's nothing here. Everything's shut down. Everything's destroyed. There's no power to no nothing. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I don't even have a house. It's probably gone. And uh, waiting to hear what's going on. And then my mom and dad were retired in South Florida. And they drove. <laughs> it was great. They drove up to Pensacola with, with a van full of generators and bottled water. They just picked up as many as they could and just drove through the neighborhood and started giving them out uh, to get to my house. And they said they drove by the house. And I was so lucky. I had my fence blew over and, like, four shingles were gone. And that was it. So as soon as I found out the house was intact and okay, I called the skipper. I was like, I got a place to stay. He's like, come on over. So I got him the ticket and came back and just tried to help clean up, basically. How, how long was everything? I know the base took substantial damage from that storm. How long um, was everything down here before m- uh, before training could start again, well, I should uh, say? Easily months, months. Matter really? of fact, to the point where they put in like temporary hangar kind of office things. Between the two hangars, between V10 yes, and VTAC, yes. in that whole area, there were multiple trailer hangars, which were actually really nice office things. And they were there for so long that they were still finishing the refurbishment of the hangars that another hurricane was coming. And I remember, forget this, we're basically doing another hurricane evacuation. And as I'm walking through our main hangars, the guys are finishing putting the tiles down to finish the refurb right in time for the next hurricane to come to peel the roof off and do it again. It's like, you guys can stop now. It's coming. Wow. <laughs> it was so funny. That's insane. But uh, yeah, it, it took a while. It took a while to get right back on their feet again. It was, my brother said it once when he came to visit, it was, you know, driving down the back roads over here towards the, you know, the water. And there was, you know, there'd be a washer in the middle of the highway and there's studs and there's no house and there's, oh, there's tile where the kitchen used to be. He said, it looked like it was like, what is this? It's free Lebanon, 1984. I mean, what is this? Beirut? You know, it's what it looked like, a war zone. I have been very fortunate all the time that I've been stationed here to find a piece of wood to knock on that I've not been here for a storm. And I'm told, you know, get ready. Now I'm qualified, right? I'm going to fly an airplane. If we have a hurry back, yeah. uh, my airplane goes first, and then I'll take one of the T6s here after that. Oh, but, there you go. Um, I'm only partially kidding when I say that. But, like, truly, all jokes aside, it's a part of life and it's part of the world. And yeah, when it's coming, you get out of the way. At least we know we have warning, which is the good thing. And yes. That's all you can do. And exactly. That's all you can do. You can't live your life in fear, but you, yeah, you know, of course not. common sense and good judgment usually prevails. Usually. Once everything spun back up, though, what was the rest of your time? How long were you here for that tour? Uh, it was another two-year tour. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So wow. How did you work that I, That's pretty drug cool. Drug deal. Drug deal. Because, well, you know, because there were only two-year tours back-to-back, so the PCS, PCS, I think the permanent change of station stuff, it was, it was a lot of moving. Um, and. What's the difference? What are you seeing different now? Because, again, you, you talked about you were away for two years. Can you see a difference in the students? Can you see a difference in the instructor, the cadre? Like, what uh, what changed? Because I think with the benefit of time, usually you can kind of see some of those things that you wouldn't necessarily see when you're in the trenches daily. I'm trying to think about that. Not much, honestly. I think it was Stayed the of, same? Yeah, it stayed the same. The same motivations. The aircraft did change. Okay. Um, so with the Tomcat going away and the new Super Hornet stuff coming online. So there's a little bit different mindset with that. Plus, the S3 went away. And the Prowler community basically was slowly going away as well. So, so you're making less people. Yeah, less people. Plus, internationals were coming and going. So we had, you know, Singaporeans doing F-15, F-16, F-15, really Strike Eagle. Uh, the Air Force went away to do their own thing. So we, we lost the T-39 and began the process of transitioning to the new T-45 Goshawk and the new virtual mission training system we have now, which is really, really good, quite honestly. It's excellent, actually. Um, it's very good at cranking out some good weapon systems and EWOs. Um so that was that whole kind of process. And that went actually from, and I finished active duty right about then, I think it was 06. 
September 30th was my last day as a reservist. October 1st, I was a reservist of BT-86. I didn't even have to change a patch. I just went right. I had a sim that day. Went right back to work. So Wow. Um, so that was I was lucky to slide in and work that process when I left active duty to go immediately to the reserves the next day. For those unfamiliar with active duty FTS reserve, I think the terms can sometimes be a, a little bit challenging. Can you kind of break down the difference? Because like you yeah. said, you walked back in with the same patches on, yeah. but now you are it's supporting the squadron, but in a different way. Yeah. So cell res or selector. So there's a couple different types of reserve, I guess, for lack of a better word, without dumbing it down. Uh, there's traditional, you know, one week in a month, two week a year you know, obligations. Then you have to have a minimum, uh, you know, a participation to have a good anniversary year to count towards retirement. So one week a month, two weeks a year, that works out to, uh, you know, an average drill weekend for when they come in and they do whatever they do. I don't know. Uh, it's uh, two drill periods per day. So that's four per weekend. So it works out to 48 drill periods for a year is what they call them. Um, and then two weeks of active duty. So essentially 10 days with the weekends, that kind of thing. Um, cell res is a little different because you're more augmenting. So when I was part of the the squadron augment unit attached to VT-86, and you have SALs, you know, the FRSs and things like that, that are augmenting the active duty staff, you're basically part of their schedule. So it's not a one week and a month thing. It's, you know, you, you have to do a minimum. More. And there's more obligation as expectation to join the unit. So when I first joined the unit, I was doing 48 drills plus an additional 72 drills plus an additional 29 days of active duty. So it was a lot of a lot of work, and this is uh, when I went from active to reserve, and then got a job in the sim instructor job. It was part time. That's the only way I was able to kind of do that, and I was I was cranking max it out. And then even then after, so it's it worked out to essentially anywhere from five to ten days a month that I was just doing Navy Reserve stuff, but on the flight suit Monday through Friday kind of thing because you know weekends they close down here. So it's essentially another part time full time job. Wow, um, <clears throat> but that's good. Because of the SAL, when I was part of the SAL, we had, what, 14, 13 guys and gal, 14 when I was a CEO, and we did about 26% of all the sorties that the squadron did, all my reserve guys and gals did, yeah. So, and me, we tried, you know, between sims and flights. So, the, on average, a SAL usually does about a quarter of all the, uh, the sorties, because that's your job. Your job is to go in and make the donuts. Go do it. Uh, and keep coming back and doing it. And so, that's the expectation for people when they, if anybody wants to go to the reserves, yeah, you know, come make the donuts. You got to come on. So we, I know there's reservists that fl- drive from Texas to come here to do it. And they come here for a week and they crank them out, stay in the queue on base, and then they drive home and go back to their normal job. And they do it once a month, spend a week a month out here. And you mentioned, you already kind of alluded to it a couple of times. You, your final job here at 86 was as the CEO of the SAL. Yeah. How many years between when you, when you talked about putting on that reserve uniform to that, uh, to making command? Uh, it was six to 13, so seven, seven, eight years, okay. eight, eight years as an instructor at 86, which was great. And then working in the sim job, which was great because it's literally the same commute. And there would be days where I would, you know, drive to work and wear a polo shirt that I'm wearing now. And then, okay, work day is done. And I have a brief in five minutes and I go in the bathroom, put the flight suit on and go right back and go do that. Yeah. So, wow. so it was kind of, it was just, you know, the best of both worlds. It's from both angles of the same exact same students, same syllabus, same events. So it was, uh. I think it helps spread the subject matter stuff a little bit around, hopefully a little credibility at the time. Um, Absolutely. That's the reason why I think like you talked about the reserve component is so strong as you're, yeah, you're not full time necessarily all the time, but you're still able to kind of maintain that continuity and you know, someone that has that overall perspective. Absolutely. I call them, uh, usually reserve guys and SAL guys are, <clears throat> I call them the squadron historians. You know, hey, we got an idea. We're going to go do a debt in Charleston. Yeah, we did that in 2006. Here's what happened. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. Here's what we do. We tried that in 2010. Here's what that's happened. It's an important job. Yeah. So you're the you're the long view squadron historian kind of thing. Yeah. You know, we did the training syllabus. We did it this way. We did that once before. That didn't work. But maybe we could do it this way different. You know. And so the good idea fairy shows up, and usually there's an old sow guy going, uh, yeah, we tried that. <laughs> it's a good thing. You here's need what, that person. Here's what happened. Or you know what? That could work. Let's see if we can do it. You know, that kind of thing. And it, I think it's a little bit of a the long view kind of historic thing. Plus not to mention, you know, when you get the average bub and they've got, you know, 2000, 3000 freaking, freaking hours in the aircraft or more based on the SIM guys, I can't imagine what the numbers are for some of them. And they're probably in the thousands of hours of instruction. Yeah, at some point, something's going to kick in. You got to listen. So that's a lot of experience that you can't, you can't give away to. Not at all. You, know. you can't bank on that. That's why it's worth every penny, I think. I know you are probably one of the one of the experts here in the building, obviously, on the SIM, the T-45 SIM. Can you talk a little bit to what that does for us, that mission training system? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, it saves the Navy and the taxpayer a lot of money because uh, gas is expensive, as everybody knows right now. Uh, and it's a, so, that's a good uh, that's a good point to start this with. Absolutely. Gas is very expensive right now. Uh, if it gives perspective from when I remember going through the RAG as just a, the level of training that the WIZOs that graduate in EWOs that graduate with here— 
Um, when I was going through the FRS and VF 101, one of my sim instructors, JC Sneed, great funny guy, he was one of the guys that ferried the jets to Iran. He was actually in Final Countdown in the Jolly Rogers. Ferried the F 14 yeah, to the, Iran. Yeah. Wow. He said that my FRS early phase weapon control basic air to intercept phase was his top gun phase. Yeah, that's how it progressed. Wow. So I finished the rag, do all this stuff. Now I'm over here. Now we're doing the stuff with the virtual mission training system. We're doing literally intercepts, escorts, strikes, close air support, uh, 2v2, 2vx, which is types of missions. We fight that kind of stuff like that. The stuff they're learning here was my tactics phase to finish up the FRS to go to a fleet squadron. So you can see where this is going. That as we progress more and more, we're kind of not offloading, but we're actually kind of getting sharper, better students, more tactically sound earlier before they even get to the gray airplanes. So when they show up to the FRS, it's kind of like, yeah, all right, what do you want to know? You know? I mean, show me how to fly the airplane. I've never been in it before, but I know what you mean when you say we got to do a nine line for close air support. I'm ready to go. Let's go. Yeah. And as I understand it, you know, we talked about the T-39, you have that F-16 radar. You talked about different ways that, you know, you're going to have multiple people learning. Yep. Here, you're not necessarily you know, in flight, you are in the actual T-45, but when you're in the Sims here, it's all that same symbology as I understand there's a lot of overlap between this and the uh, Hornet. Yep. I wanna make sure it's, I'm saying it right. It's actually a baby Super Hornet. Baby, baby Super right. Hornet, yeah. yep. So you've got those reps, you've got that appreciation for it yep. and the cheapest, simplest way to do it. Which is these simulators in the building yep, with us right absolutely. now? Absolutely. And yeah. then we what, still what do more could you aircraft. ask for? We do it. And, and then I was going to say, and then yeah, yeah no, that's what you could ask for. Then you actually yeah. go do it in yeah. flight with all the dynamics and the G and the hot, sweaty Florida summer you, and all that stuff. You cannot replace pulling G's and sweating, looking over your shoulder for a bad guy. You can't. I'm sorry. I know sometimes that comes up where people say, "Oh, it's just an airborne simulator." No, you need to strap in an airplane. You need to have your life in the ejection seat. And understand the ramifications of what that means. And when you go to emerge, and you better be at your freaking altitude when you go to emerge, because if you don't, you're swimming home, kind of thing. You cannot buy that in a simulator because you know you're not going to die in a simulator. Simple as that. And you shouldn't die in an airplane. Not going to right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but there's something to be said for that whole process. And there's again, like I said, pulling G's you cannot replace in a sim. You know, as one guy said once, ah, you know, I play a computer video game. Uh, you know, I think I can, yeah, I can drive an F1 or I can, I think I can fly a dogfight. It's like, yeah, dude, when your computer pulls eight G's and shoots back at you, give me a call, right? Otherwise, it's not reality. Yeah. yeah. Go say hi to your mom <laughs> in your basement, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah, so the airborne, but the training to get them to that level, we're not wasting any time. So by the time they strap in an airplane and do this stuff, and then I said, when they get the FRS, fight's on, <laughs> release the hounds, watch them, watch them go. Have you, so I know obviously working on the south side, did you get a lot of time in the T-45? Yeah. Yeah, I got a bunch, yeah. How would you compare it to what you what you know really, really well? It's it's not a Tomcat. Obviously, it's not a T2 yeah. or, a, or a T39. Yeah. But where would it fall in that mix? How would you describe it to someone that hasn't uh, flown the Goshawk? It is a great, it is a baby Hornet. So you you, you are learning what it's going to be like in a gray airplane, which is what's great about it. Yeah, so it's uh, just from the multifunction displays and how they operate. And then the radar is essentially a dumbed-down version, unclass version of it. Um, it is essentially a procedural trainer to get you ready for multifunction displays in a tactical aircraft, yeah. And it's a and it's a pretty good performing little airplane. I mean, it's older, it's 35, 40 years, whatever it is now, 45 plus, maybe, I don't even know. Uh, the Brits are starting to retire them, if that tells you anything. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's originally, it was a BAE Hawk, yeah, but then it was modernized yeah. and marinized, I guess I should say, put a tail hook on it, put beefier gear on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Some of the boxes still have like a, a, a it's not McDonnell Douglas. I think McDonnell Douglas did a lot of the work on it, but yeah. some of the stuff from BAE, it's kind of crazy to see this old British stuff still sitting still around. Still in there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, 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 It's good. It's good at what it does. Uh, the T2 was older. It was like sitting in an old bathtub with that big giant wing, but it fought great, but it didn't have a HUD. No electronics really in it. Rudimentary gauges. This thing is a little bit more modern, more tactical. Um, and now with the virtual mission training system, it really is a good platform for training with those and Evos, which is great for that. Yeah, so what the future will be, no idea. Uh, they're writing the requirements now. We'll see what the replacement for the T-45 will be. Would it be like the, the, the I guess, the, the Red Hawk? The T-7, Hawk, yeah. yeah T-7, the Air maybe, Force. or some variation thereof, or will it be international? I don't know. Will I still be here then? I don't know. One day at a time. So, uh, but for what it does right now, I think it's a good, by eliminating the multiple aircraft, when I came through, it was T-34, T-1, T-39, T-2, slash A-4, slash AT-38B T-38, yeah, exactly. to the F-14. Now it's literally they come and they do T-6, which you fly, and then yep. they go right to the T-45. And it's essentially more time and training in one aircraft means more. You're spending less time on the basics and more on let's get to work kind of stuff. And so I think it makes them sharper in a shorter period of time. 
That's great. Hopefully that's the case. That uh, How long were you in command of the South? Uh, actually, it was two and a half years. Yeah, so I, I left for an IA to go do some stuff with some of the JSOC Bubba's and then came back, which was great. And then like, hey, uh, you mind sticking around to stretch it out so we can make the fitness reports work better? I'm like, no problem. I will I will make the sacrifice. I will, yeah, so it's like an extra <laughs> like five or six months. Do so you mind doing it? No problem. Well, the, the amount of time doesn't matter. I guess what I was trying to ask is... What, uh, looking back on it now, what did you, if you could talk to Millie day one, when you were checking into that job, what would you tell yourself? Anything different? Uh, I know being in command, you know, it's, you've got reservists, so it's a little bit different being, I would assume it's a little different being in command of like an active duty Navy guys or, you know, uh, sailors in the fleet. It's a little bit different environment. I get it. Yeah. But what, uh, looking back on it, are there things that you wish you'd known or yeah. things you're glad you know now? Um, you don't work for the, what is it? How the student doesn't work for you. You work for the student. He's your customer. He's your he's your problem. He's your he's your child. He's he or she, I say interchangeably. Um, you, yeah, it's all for them. That's the whole point of why we're here. That's the whole point of why this building's built is for them to be ready to go out to the fleet and go do some good work. And if they don't do it safely or smartly, what are you doing here? Um, so so when I first showed up, it was like, hey, shore duty, awesome. I'm gonna have a good time and maybe I'll shell. So, you know, whatever. I'll teach some of these guys and. Uh, my my initial, you know, your original idea is, all right, just, you know, the check-in is usually, they do a lot of good stuff with check-in right now. Then it was kind of like in the old days, it was like, all right, just remember any crappy instructors you had? Don't be that guy. Remember any cool instructors? Be that guy. All right, go, 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 go crazy, right? Try to stay within the standardization and don't go too far from that. And so it was just more of a, I didn't, I didn't, not that I didn't take it seriously, but I think it was more of a, why are you here? You know, is it because it's a good deal and it's a good short duty, or is it because you are eventually going to go back to a squadron with them on your wing? And, and or worse, they're going to be in an airplane with one of your friends and one of your bros or colleagues from before, and you're the one that put them in that said, hey, they're ready. So that's your reputation, too. So I, like I said, I take very personally their success or failure um, because what did I do, wrong or right? Yeah. Um, so. The, the, the whole purpose of being here, the student comes first, everything's secondary. And I say that as a contract flight simulator guy and as a guy who still wears a flight suit as a reservist, the student comes first and then we'll deal with the stuff after. And if, if I'm doing something wrong, we'll, we'll sort it out in a meeting after. Yeah, That's a great attitude, I think. Because that's, that's yeah. why we're here. Yep. Sometimes people forget that. It's easy, though, because if it's not in your face, if it's not something that you have that appreciation for, I think any anything can become just a job. Anything yeah. can become just, well, you know, yeah. I, I have my little sandbox and I hate that uh, when people will say, well, that's not my job. Oh. At the end of the day, it's all of our jobs. Yeah. And if you're waiting for the more you know responsible person to show up and take charge, it's not. It's you. So yeah. you need to feel that onus of Absolutely. That, that burden on you, as, as silly as it might sound. No, it's not. That's, that's why we're here. Yeah. yeah. Well, you talked about uh, still wearing that green flight suit, and you're still, sir, to me, obviously, uh, right. active duty. Well, not active duty, but a captain. We're still wearing the uniform is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Uh, what do you? What's the job now? What are you doing now? So uh, currently attached to uh, Nautic out there, Naval Aviation War Fighting Development Center out there in Fallon, Nevada. So that's basically the big command that kind of subsumes, for lack of a better word, uh, a little bit of everything. So they do, you know, there's where Top Gun is. They also have the electronic warfare version for the Growler guys. Uh, they have the, uh, the JTAC school as well, so the SEALs are out there doing some stuff and things like that. And there's a couple other places they do some Hilo stuff, some stuff everything. Uh, it's essentially the Center for Excellence for Improving Naval Aviation Warfighting and all the components thereof. And everybody knows it for Top Gun, obviously. Um, so what I'm attached to is what's called Nautic Strike. Strike is directly associated for and responsible for air wing training. So there's an active duty contingent over there. Um, all the guys are adversary and or Top Gun patch wearing guys and gals. And what they do is they're all usually flight qualified. And, and there's multiple airplanes from the weapons school up there. So Super Hornets, uh, F-16 Vipers that are the Top Gun jets. And uh, we also have a contingent of VFC-13 uh, um, F-5s out there. That's on a kind of permanent debt there. With permanent debt. That's where they are. Um, and their job is to be professional adversary support. So Strike is responsible for when air wings do workups, for lack of a better word. Uh, in 30 seconds or less, student gets their wings, uh, they go to the FRS, they graduate the FRS, and they're considered like level one qualified in the aircraft basic stuff. They get attached to a squadron, and they kind of work up to level two, level three, level four, strike fighter weapons, tactics, level training, that kind of thing. And the unit has to do that as well. So they get individual qualifications up to it, and the unit, the squadron, has to work up to certain qualifications up to it, including like uh, something called SFAR, Strike Fighter Advanced Readiness Program, where they'll go out and go to Fallon, and they'll go fight the adversaries by themselves. And then they'll go do other stuff and go do strikes, and they'll Centro or whatever. They'll go to Key West, do dogfight debts. And then they'll take the whole air wing, and they'll put them essentially out in air wing Fallon where they're all working as one big giant wing for like a better word. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. It's called an air wing. 
And then after they finish that, they'll go out and do a couple other things, and they'll qualify in the boat, and they'll do something called Comp 2 at Composite uh, Training Exercise. Off the aircraft carrier, doing the same thing, fighting against adversaries, and we do some stuff with that. So our job is to be the meanest, nastiest, red air guys we can, uh, to beat up on them as much as we can. No, we try to kind of present the proper, proper threats that they're going to probably experience so they get the most lessons learned in the shortest period of time. So we do professional adversary radar stuff. So my job as a radar controller um, is uh, you know, adversary tactics, radar controller. So essentially, you know, have the red card. Hey, here's the thing we're going to do today. Today's blue mission is a large force strike. Here's their target. Here's their route. These are the threats they brief. So here's our threats. We're going to have, you know, 18 red air. And these four will be make 29. These guys will be uh, J7s. These guys will be whatever. And these are the types of threats. So we're you know, early in the war, so we're just going to be capping. Later in the war, the road to war progression towards war kind of stuff or, or how aggressive we get kind of stuff and then after then it becomes a free-for-all <laughs> so you're emulating essentially a threat nation actually top gun does not officially end or strike nautic does not officially represent or re- replicate nations okay se. we represent or replicate tactics and Tac- technology well you know what i'm glad you set me straight so you're going to represent that Yes. That piece of technology, you mentioned exactly. that MiG-29 or that J-7. And the capabilities. And yeah. the capabilities that those bring to bear because that's who an aviator is going to be fighting yeah. against. And how to recognize them, how to fight them, how to defeat them, and that sure. kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so it's really neat to be taking it from this level of you know, being an instructor here, being an old Tomcat guy, and to be able to kind of sit and kind of go, all right, this is what we're doing right now. Uh, not bringing it back here to classify stuff. No, of course not. to kind of, of see not. what the latest and greatest stuff of how we're doing, winning and losing, and, and, and just the big picture overall, how you know how war fighting is advanced with data link and things like that, and 35s and 22s. Um, so it's it's really rewarding to be able to sit. And plus, I get a little, I hate to say it, a little bit of a sick pleasure in sitting at the console and having essentially at my fingertips with a microphone in my hand and my big giant display with all the all the airplanes all set up nicely for me. I can see everybody, all the good guys, all the bad guys, and I can start. You know what? I'm going to go attack the aircraft carrier right now and um, pretty much going to go beat up on it. And it's just like my personal, <laughs> I don't hate the Napoleon. I don't know. God's eye view of uh, the whole thing. Basically. Yeah. And usually I'll even have the copy of the blue card, which is all the, the fighters. And if I see the names, if I recognize one, I'm like, oh, I'm going to send a couple of fives just to, you know, for my buddy there. Just he has two guys at the merge instead of one to play with because, you know, it's all about fun. That's funny. It was a topic we hadn't even talked about beforehand, but a uh, contract red air, I think, is something big. So it, yeah. it may be something as simple as Phoenix. I know those guys have a thing. Learjets, they've got different emulators, some pretty fancy uh, toys on board. There's, you know. It is a multi billion dollar. I think the Air Force alone wanted a couple billion dollars worth of, I don't know, 25,000 hours. Yeah. That's why squadrons are being bought up, you know, ATAC and freaking TAC. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, it's only getting bigger. There's only yeah. more commercial players in that space. Yeah. Uh, do you think that's the direction it's going to go? Is it that, that's a way to cheap, not cheap is a big, it's the wrong word maybe, but a big word, a cost effective way to emulate those threat tactics and aircraft, not nations, right? Um, but in a way that our military can train against, is that the way, is that kind of the future as opposed to, like, I don't know if we have a choice because okay. it's, it, it's hard on airframes and it's hard on air crew and we don't have enough of both. So I think that's why it's going that way because we are, we have a real problem right now with maintaining our crew. Uh, rightfully so, I get it. They're getting burned out or tired and or, you know, the current world isn't helping. Um, and it's hard on airplanes. So to be able to contract that stuff out, um, it, I think it works out to be a little cheaper in the long run. Um, that's why even, even here, you know, training commands and training squadrons, you have contract maintenance because it's just very, it's, it's, it, and it's expensive, but it's hard to get the personnel and, the, you know, that kind of stuff. So I think that's just the future for now, quite honestly. Uh, I can see them already talking about doing F-35 adversary squadrons. I mean, I can see them already planning that. So that might be something we'll see from the military side. But I don't. I would not be surprised to see, keep seeing what we're seeing where, where they're buying like the Australian F-18s and you know the remainder of the F-16s, especially as people are now buying F-35s in other countries. Well, all those jets are going on the market, and guess what? That's hot. <laughs> yeah. Billions of dollars in contracts. Makes uh, sense. But what you get at the end of the day is you get a very capable Category 3, Category 4, and maybe eventually Category 5 red or adversary that you can fight against, and you're only as good as the people you fight against. You know, as you know, was a comic book hero is only as, as good as the villain he's fighting. You know what I mean? True. So <laughs> the tougher the villain, the better the hero, you're I guess. only as good as your training. And that's, that's the, kind of the next thing I wanted to naturally ask about uh, without, again, talking about anything we can't talk about. Are there other people in this space that play the way we do? I, I feel like we are up in you know, the U.S., obviously the U.S. Defense Department. We're probably yeah. the, the big name, right? Yeah. But I feel like that's what also sets us apart is that ability to emulate and train at a really, really the, good, good Lord. I mean, you're talking about the radar scan and how, how accurate you had it tuned. Yeah. 
I hope we're the only ones training to that level of fidelity, but I also can't keep my eyes closed and think, think that our adversaries aren't. I think our partner nations also do that a lot. Okay. And as a matter of fact, now with the commonality of technology and parts and even platforms right now with the F-35 being so, oh my God. The F-16 is the most sold, proliferated fighter aircraft in the world. More countries fly that thing than I think anything else. I can't remember how many, like thousands and thousands of them. It's like P-51s and World War II kind of level. I mean, it's crazy. Not that many. Um, so I think the commonality of tactics, procedures, and stuff like that alone, and that's part of the reason, the NATO stuff, the commonality of even ammunition and standards and comm standards and stuff like that, the integration. So by default, that all drags everything together. Now, if we have a certain standard, I can't really speak to how hard other countries train individually. I've never done it like a dissociated tour like the Germans or the UK and stuff like that. But I have a pretty good feeling that the people are cut from the same cloth which means they take what they got and they want to go win. Nobody likes to lose. So if you're a type A person that flies a jet or something like that, or you strap anything on an airplane to put something on warheads on foreheads, you don't want to lose. So I think they're going to do, everybody's got that unique kind of thing. No matter what platform you fly or where you're from, you know, you want to be the best at it, what you got. So, yeah, I think do what we do differently is maybe we have a very long standing history of always trying to be better than the aviator of war an hour ago and beating the hell out of ourselves, going in for 1.7 hour mission and debriefing it for five hours, that kind of thing. Who the hell does that on a Friday, right? We do. Uh, and that's why we're hyperpowers. The poli sci guys say in the old days it used to be, you know, superpowers. Well, the gap between us and the previous nations became so, so huge and so exaggerated that they started coining it as hyperpower. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if we are now. That was about 15 years ago. I haven't heard that term before. That's uh, interesting. Yeah. So I remember going through some more college stuff with that. Anyway, so, um, I think it comes down at the end of the day, like any other country, any other nation, you know, yes, it's people and parts. It's also mindset mentality. I think America has unique. The risk of sounding uh, all foo-foo and, again, Republicans going to be fine. I had this argument with a NATO buddy of mine. Uh, all you Americans. Oh, here we go. Right? That kind of thing. But in jest over, you know, over Nuzo. And uh, I was like, what, what makes you guys so special for lack thereof, like the, whatever the argument was? And I remember going, you know what? All right, let's look across the bar over here, and there's, you know, uniforms in different countries. And you look at the names of all, like there's the Germans, there's the Italians, there's the Greeks, whatever. And you look at the names, like and all the names were from their perspective. Now look at the American uniforms, and look at all the names. And there's an O'Shaughnessy, and there's a Slavic guy, and there's a German guy, and there's a French guy. And, like, look at all the last names, and look at them different, you know, whatever. It's like, it's because we got all the best parts, you know, for the meatloaf, man. That's why. <laughs> um, and, and the right combination, the right place, and the right place like here at the risk of being all super patriotic is yeah you got a formula for success for success because it comes down to individual guys that strap on a flight suit every day and go i want to be better than i was yesterday i hope so simple i hope that's it. the standard that we continue to all and hold it, each other to it's just that simple it really is yeah yeah what'd you do today what's the most excellent thing you did today what can you do tomorrow make it better do it how long have you been in the nautic job uh, I did three years uh, and then left for a year to go to Navy History Heritage Command, uh, which was cool. It would be like doing historian stuff. That would be unique. And then got there, checked in, qualified, and found out they were defunding the unit. So uh, I know it was so sad because up in the D.C. Navy Yard, really great people too, really fantastic. Um, and then called the current CEO. I was like, hey, you want me back? And like, absolutely. So we, easiest thing I ever did in the Navy. Anything else, God forbid, you know, for those that do admin in the Navy. Like you try upgrading your rental car in orders and watch what happens congressional inquiry so i tried to get an interrupted set of orders and a change of orders to another unit it took one letter two phone calls and two weeks later i was back in the unit it was quick it was amazing so uh back with not again uh this will probably take me to 2025 and i was just talking to the current ceo and uh, all things being equal unless somebody else comes in i think i'm going to be his relief and then do another two years, and that'll take me to 31 years, and I'm going to retire. Can so. you just do that here? Is that a remote type thing, or are you going to have to? Yeah, so that okay. reserve thing, flex drill, fund of travel, that's a key thing. So this one is that extra stuff, and depending on where the units are based out of and or what they support, flex drill means you go where you need to go to go do it, and the fund of travel is, all right, we'll take you out to the exercises, get you there to go do your job. That's incredible. Because that could change. So I yeah. go to Jacksonville, yeah, yeah. I go to whatever, you know, to Fallon, whatever. So. So I'm out to Fallon or Jacksonville probably five or six times a year for a couple weeks at a time um, to do this stuff. So it takes up a lot of time. My wife's very patient. God bless her for doing it um, because it is a lot of travel back and forth. I unpack one suitcase and come to work here, and then I go back out again. And then my bosses here have been fantastic too. So And then, you're yeah, you're shaping the next uh, generation of naval aviation so. here, right? Ed? One little bit at a time, I guess. I hope. I hope so. <laughs> we'll see. Absolutely. We'll find out in 10 years, right? <laughs> no, I think, uh, I think like you said, it's the, the continuity, the ability to have that, you know, it might sound like a silly thing and, and uh, you know, take it for what it is, but, you know, 
I never saw a Tomcat fly, truly. It's yeah. kind of a I think I maybe saw an F-117 once. I saw a space shuttle launch once. Cool. But what I'm getting at is that some of that uh, that history and heritage, it maybe doesn't feel like history and heritage to you, but to me, knowing someone that did the thing, it's so cool. It gives me that connection to, hmm. you know, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I've got four flight on that. Is it me sounding like an old man? I remember when four flight wasn't a thing. I do, too. I remember when it was a VFR sectional because that's how I got my pilot's license. Oh, I, I in a T-39 because I, I, I got my ceiling raised in the outside. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And I would fly with four flight and sit in the jump seat. And then, hey, where are we at, student? And I have no idea. And I go, hey, look, that's taxiway Charlie. How the hell does he know? <laughs> Yeah, because I'm smart. No, <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> but what I'm getting is like that ability to. I remember what it was like before these tools and techniques and and you know the God's eye view existed. It's nice to know folks that. Uh, I don't know why. For some reason, there's a lot of folks. I was talking to a friend recently, and he was you know made some smart ass comment about NFOs, and you're like, why do in this day and age? I'm like, yeah, man. Well, first off, I love you, but you don't like that's not a world you live in. So, and second off, the appreciation for you know you couldn't fly, you couldn't fight the Tom without both of you, right? You were you were a necessary member of the crew. Yeah. And guess what? It's the same in the Growler. It's yeah, the same as Super busy. Hornet, right? Like there's a reason why. And so being able to communicate that and understand that, well, why is because the, the work that you did, right? Growler, Dropping bombs and, and shooting the Phoenix. Yeah, the Growler came. Remember, the Prowler had three, three ECMOs. people. Yes, exactly. And a pilot. Yes. And now it's down to one pilot and one. Yes. Well, that's a lot of, yeah. Yeah. And, a lot of responsibility on one person. And I'm, I'll be honest with you. I freely admit I have, I'm very impressed with the ability of a single seat pilot to be able to process and do all the stuff that. I would do in a two seat airplane because it does take a lot of brain power to kind of keep track of what's going on in such a dynamic environment, that kind of thing. So yeah, when you meet somebody that's a single seat person, that's wearing a patch on their shoulders, like, okay, respect. You clearly are, there's something going on right up there in that head. You know, it ain't bragging if it's true. Yeah. Okay, cool. But you do wish you had me up there when the was crappy. <laughs> You know, when the poop's hitting the fan and there's 23 planes coming at you. Yeah, one more one more brain would help out. So yeah. that's when it that's when it works out. But well. it's, not, okay. it's not that brain. It's that, well, you talked about that synergy earlier, yeah. right? That is. is something that's so priceless. And when you fly with someone that uh, that brings that, man, it's just the greatest feeling yeah, in the I world. I mean, you've had it too. You're pilot, co-pilot, right? And, you're, so when you guys are, and you know when it's, you're flying with somebody, it's like, uh, it's like, and then sometimes you are, wow, you're one, it's like one amoeba machine. I can't describe it. You know what I'm talking no, about. No, you can't describe it, yeah. but you feel it when you know it. It's oh. like there's nothing this crew can't do. You're, you're just synced up, yeah. And yeah. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. It's a really wonderful feeling, yeah. So that's what's next for you, and then obviously, like you said, talked about uh, still doing stuff here. But, yeah, uh, and yeah. then uh, so that'll take me through for seven more years. Yeah. I've got 27, and that'll, yeah, 2027. Is it still an 06 uh, billet? Yeah. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not going to, that's enough. I was going to say, I don't know how it works in the reserve world. How uh, can you pin on a star? Uh, me? No, <laughs> no, no. I'm that's, that's, that's for, for better men and women than me that, that are, no, I'm my, I'm my place. I know. Hey, I'm not born to play in the NBA. I'm not slam dunking anytime soon. I'm not kicking indoors with the seals. So no, I'm good. I'm good where I'm at doing what I need to be doing. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah, it's fine with me. <laughs> we talked about a lot. I always like to kind of give the person I'm asking the last word. Uh, but before I do that, I want to say thank you. Truly do appreciate you taking the time to oh, talk me through. Thank you for asking me. This is fun. I feel no. bad I'm talking about myself, which is dumb. That is literally all I want to hear about. I appreciate yeah. it. This is really neat. Any uh, Anything I missed? Any questions I didn't ask? Or just final thoughts over over to you, sir. I want to say is I'm really happy for that you're doing this. It's really impressive that you're doing full-time work as an instructor and you're still doing this. And the podcasts are phenomenal. I listened to a bunch of them. I, did, I went to Jacksonville for Comp2X and... When I was driving out there, I was just cranking up the podcast like, oh, man, he's good at this. This is fantastic. The key is to talk to interesting people. So. Oh, well, we might have recorded me. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, no, keep doing what you're doing because I think we need this kind of stuff out there in the world. Obviously, this is, you know, <laughs> they don't pay me to, to talk about flying. I do that for free, right? They pay me to be away from my house to do it. That's what the idea is. You know, that's the idea. So if we get more people energetic and, you know, based on the audience, if people can get any little bit of this. As like I said before, as, as instructors, any little thing that we have in our reservoir, in our tank that we can share with other people so they don't learn it the hard way, psh, that's the whole point of what we do. So if one little tidbit makes somebody even grin and laugh and remember one little thing, when that light comes on, okay, great. Maybe you did something to move that football in the right direction. That's good for me. Happy to be here. Happy awesome. to be here, boss. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, brother.